Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It's Friday, the best day of the week. Yes, sir. It's the Friday free-for-all mailbag, and we got a special surprise for everyone out there. Sean Styers is in the house with us today. What's up, Sean? How you doing? Doing Uh, good? Yeah, man. Of course. Explain to the people why it's important for them to know who Sean is. Well, <laughs> I, it's important for the people to know who Sean is because Sean is the host of the IB Nation sports talk show that is on Monday through Thursday at 6 o'clock. And it goes till, I don't know, 7, 7.15. Depends on the topic, frankly. Uh, but Very make true. sure you tune in for that. Make sure you tune in for that. Sean's we went for a long block. time on Tuesday this week. Yes, we because, did. Of course, Vince is on a couple days a week with me, and we went for a long time Tuesday. And... Here's what I found out, you know, with my internet capabilities that I have, it takes a lot longer just for like 20, for like 30 more minutes of a show. It takes a lot longer to <laughs> upload that sucker when it's all said and done. But we had a lot of good, we had a lot of good stuff in that Yes, show. and so there will be more stuff coming. Definitely, right. no question about that. And then, of course, I'm always joined by that guy right there. That's Brian Driscoll. He's a publisher at IrishBreakdown.com. Now I'm just that guy. Sean that joins guy. the show, and I'm just that guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy. That guy over there. I forget his name. Oh, what is it? Uh, Brian. Uh, That's wait, it. I knew I, it. Oh, I knew I, why it. do I know your name? Oh, because you yeah. signed my paycheck. So, yeah. So you're <laughs> yes. very, you're, I didn't go there. Yes, you're a pretty important guy. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go there. I've it's seen that. People. I didn't go there. I've seen that <laughs> signature someplace before. All right. Uh, but anyway, it is a Friday free-for-all mailbag, which means you – the viewer slash listener drive the show. We've already got a bunch of great questions queued up and we're going to start with a super chat from our guy, Kevin Carter. Thank you so much for the super chat, Kevin, you got something, Brian, before we, well, I, we kind of said we were going to start with a little something else, another topic that everybody wants to hear about. Oh, I thought you said, I, I misunderstood you. I yeah. thought we were going to start with the super chat. No, Hit it. we're going to start. Go ahead. With, yeah. I mean, why don't you go ahead and intro what we're going to talk about? Well, I believe we're going yeah. to talk about Dante Moore and the fact that he committed to Oregon. I believe he committed at this point. It was supposed to be at noon. Um, uh, I personally didn't see it happen because I was busy shoe shopping and having a great time. <laughs> it's clearly more important than listening. Much to Dante better things commit. to do. Yes. But um, but yeah, so let's 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 get this out of the way. I'm sure there's going to be questions about Dante in the chat. Uh, so Brian, I will kick it to you to kind of go where we need to go with this topic. Well, I mean, there's obviously a lot that that I'm not going to be able to say in this forum. Uh, people will be able to read about in the message board once it's back up and running. So once Dante committed, <clears throat> everyone ran to the board, <laughs> uh, slowed it down, and then it crashed. And now everyone keeps hitting refresh. And, and it just is making because, it yeah. uh, even worse. So we're fix, trying engine. to fix it <laughs> and uh, we'll get it corrected. But uh, I had Vince, you read it. I sent it to you it just did. to kind of proof it beforehand. Just a long explanation of of kind of what happened. And I will give a condensed version here because some of the stuff obviously needs to remain behind the paywall as, as best as possible until people grab it and try to pass it off as their own information. So essentially, one thing we'll say now is Dante Moore committed to Notre Dame in February. And that is the reason, part a big part of the reason that we were so confident for so long is that he yep. did commit to Notre Dame. And at the time, the original plan is he was going to go public in April. Uh, to throw a little extra salt in the wound, it was Notre Dame's idea to do it on ESPN uh, in those conversations with him. So he decided then, it, it kind of March went by and we were very confident, and he decided he wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to go public in April. And the process kind of dragged on. And, you know, Dante kept telling Notre Dame from various sources we've talked to that he was going to go to Notre Dame. And that's where he wanted to be. But, you know, he wanted to do the visit thing and do all that kind of stuff. I believe he was being encouraged to do so, let you know, to carry that process out. And as it kind of went further and further and further, Notre Dame kept trying harder and harder and harder to get him, you know, back on campus for more visits and, you know, be around other, you know, recruits and commits and, and at that time, you know, back in March, CJ Carr wanted to commit. They kind of, um, you know, tried to hold off on that as long as possible because they wanted to give Dante the opportunity to be the guy that went public first. And he wouldn't do it. And there came a point in time where Notre Dame said, look, you said you want to be here. You were going to commit then, and you pushed it back. And you said you are going to visit then. You changed it. We tried to get you on campus for the spring game. You went to LSU instead. And tried to get you on campus for June 17th. You went to Texas A&M instead. And we're begging you to get back on campus. We're begging you to beat these events to help recruit the class, all these other kind of things. And every single time, you go somewhere else. 
And, you know, I think it came to a point in time where Notre Dame felt they had, especially when CJ Carr chomping at the bit to, you know, to make his decision that Notre Dame had to kind of draw a line in the sand and say, do you, do you want to be a part of this or not? And that's when you started to hear more and more and more about Dante wanting to take it into the fall and things along those lines. And eventually Notre Dame kind of had to say, look, you know, we, we've done everything we can. There's a lot of other concerns that I believe that they had. That's the stuff that will be on the message board. There's a lot more to why Notre Dame yes. got to that ultimatum aspect. But uh, that's kind of where it was. And 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 it's, 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 it's interesting that when Notre Dame finally bows out, Dante's like, oh, I'll decide now. Yeah, you know? now, now I can do a summer uh, commitment. Yeah, yeah, and there's uh, I have some thoughts on that that I put in the message board yeah. uh, post as well. But as I said right now, that is that is unfortunately down, so people will be able to get that here pretty soon. But uh, moral of the story is Notre Dame has decided to move on. Um, there are other quarterbacks on the board. Talking to sources, we put this. If you are a message board member, you did see this yesterday, but we put this on the board uh, there's three kids at the beginning that I think Notre Dame is going to push for. We'll see kind of how they go. They're the three kids that they really like. Uh, obviously, uh, Austin Novosad, who's a quarterback from Texas, who is committed to Baylor, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Texas A&M are all working hard on him, especially Notre Dame and Ohio State. Uh, Notre Dame is also, I believe, uh, interested in Brock Glenn, who's a, a quarterback who's looking at Auburn and Florida State and some others. And I, I wouldn't be surprised. If Notre Dame also got involved with a kid named Kenny Minchie, who's from Tennessee, goes to the same high school as Golden Tate, uh, who is currently committed to Pitt. So I think those are three guys that you might that you might see Notre Dame make a run at here. Now, when the dust settles and all this stuff kind of clears and, you know, we'll get deeper into July and the, and the staff kind of shakes out who they like and who's a fit and who has the grades and all that, because they were in the all, all in on Dante train for a while. And so there's a lot of background stuff that they have to do on some of these other guys. But I think now people understand why Notre Dame was all in on him because because he committed he, in he was February. Committed. He, was, he was actively I mean, recruiting for Notre Dame for a long yeah, time. Yeah, right. You know, this wasn't just some silent commit and, and that's it. But he was actively recruiting for Notre Dame. I've talked to recruits that are going to other schools that would say Dante was going to Notre Dame and com- recruiting for Notre Dame up until you know May. Even schools he would visit would come back and my sources there would say, yeah, he's going to Notre Dame. I mean, that's just the vibe he was giving everybody. And then something changed, uh, you know, that, that, uh, you know, as I said, I've discussed further on the board, but something changed and Notre Dame realized that, you know, this is a, this is a risk that I'm not sure we can afford to take, you know, and they decided to, to move on and they have a five-star quarterback committed. And at the end of the day, here's what it boils down to. They had two five-star quarterbacks that wanted to commit. One was all about it, ready to jump on board, had to be held back, and wanted to go public, wanted to recruit, wanted to drive here for every single recruiting weekend possible, and the other kid didn't. And the other kid didn't want to go public. The other kid wanted to keep taking visits and take the process on and all those kind of things. And at the end of the day, Notre Dame decided, we want the kid that's on board. We want the kid that's going to be here, that really wants to be here. And they gave him every opportunity to be, and I'm using your words from your article, the face of the recruiting program. Like They gave him every opportunity to be that guy because he was a year, a class ahead of C.J. Carr. And they tried, they tried, they tried. He didn't want it. I mean, he, right. he didn't want it. Well, he he did. He wanted to have it to where it was, it was <clears throat> private and, you know, it was behind the scenes and all right. that other kind of stuff. And and I think Notre Dame was willing to go along with that for a long time, a long time. And eventually got to the point where it was like, look, this, you know, it, it's it's time to it's time to say, hey, do you really want to be here or not? Yeah. Right. Get your cut bait. Yeah. yeah. And you can keep telling us behind the scenes that you're committed. But if you're not willing to go public, then. What does that really say about how you exactly. feel about us? Completely and agree. I think that's what it boils down to. And there were some things, I think, working against Notre Dame that weren't going to change. And I think that part factored into it as well. So that's that's the Dante Moore stuff. We're going to focus on other non-Dante Moore related questions. We can talk about <laughs> quarterback recruiting in general, sure. and we can talk yes. about things like that. But as far as kind of what happened with Dante, you can ask questions about Dante, about you know his skill set or whatever else. But as far as like what happened and all that other kind of stuff, I mean, that, that's that's kind of where we are for now. So, okay. So let's move on to the other questions that we have. Again, Kevin Carter, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate it. He says, I'm anti conference and Ohio State, but if they <laughs> believe there is no other option, what are your thoughts on going after 
the heart and trying to get Ohio State, then flip Texas and Oklahoma to start and build from there. Suck it, Big Ten. <laughs> Glasses emoji, you know, out in the sun guy. Yes. That would be great. That would like be- if they could kind of start some like legends conference, but the reality <laughs> is it's getting that's just not practical. I mean, if you if you think it's going to be expensive to get out of your ACC contract, imagine how hard how diff, how challenging it would be to get out of a Big Ten contract. The only thing that I would say is is you know the the Big Ten contract. I I, I believe I, I'd have to find out when Ohio State's contract runs out. You know what I mean? Because like everybody signs a deal. That's why USC and UCLA are able to get out of Pac-12 because their contract was running up. Same thing with Oklahoma and Texas. But mm-hmm. I mean that'd be fun, and that'd be something I would wish they would. I, you know, it'd be a cool feature when they come out with EA Sports College Football next year, is to kind of have a realignment feature. Yeah, you know, where like you can ch- you can like trade conferences and make your own conferences like that'd be a lot of fun right like it might as well fun. because what the people, real world is right now yeah. anyway, right? <laughs> people are gonna have exactly. to adjust on the fly anyway yeah, exactly exactly you remember back in the day when you played at the end like you know you've been offered a job by so and so yeah you play like the dynasty mode like now it'd be like hey the big 10 is offering you to join their conference <laughs> or you know whatever do you want to join or not you know i think that'd I be dynasty kind of a fun mode. thing to do but uh Loved it. it, it, it I'd, I'd love for Notre Dame to start their own conference, Sean. And I, I'd kind of want your thoughts on this, but I, I, I don't. It's not going to be like Texas and Oklahoma and right. those teams, especially that just now signed contracts. It would have to go in a different direction. Yeah, and I completely agree. And you know, Vince and I kind of touched on it this week. Jesse and I touched on it a little bit on Ivy Nation Sports Talk, and I completely agree with you know that that there is you know it's it's kind of. Um, I don't necessarily think it's completely dream world to think that Notre Dame could form its own conference. But like when you're talking about these schools specifically, especially Ohio State, Texas and Oklahoma, right. you know, you, you talk about their conference, you know, their their contracts with the conferences that they're either in or are going to, you know, beyond that, they're all the, each of those three schools because of those two conferences they're in, the Big 10 and the SEC are each going to be getting around 100 million dollars plus per year to be in those conferences from, from the TV revenue. So, you know, if you're Notre Dame and, and, you know, those are the schools that you want, you know, it's like, it'd be great if you can do it, but to get those schools specifically, you're going to have to have more yeah. than a hundred million dollars per school as a starter. So, you know, it's one thing for Notre Dame to have its own uh, TV network, but it's another thing to, you know, to be able to come up with that kind of money, you know, to be able to satisfy those schools, to get them to leave the, the you know, the, the, the great, conditions that they're in already a big reason for that too sean is is that notre dame is working in a different universe in those schools yeah in regards to how important the tv money is to meeting their budgetary demands right and and that's the thing is notre dame doesn't live in this world of 200 250 million dollar operating budgets for their athletics program because they actually live within their means and so uh, I think that adds to it as well. It's not that these teams just want the eighty to one hundred million dollars being offered by the Big Ten. They need it. They need it to survive as an athletics program. Like UCLA's AD flat out admitted it, and this is a, it, it was always true, and it was always going to come to fruition. In my opinion, COVID sped that process oh, up absolutely. for a lot of schools. Yeah, absolutely, sped it up for everybody. Yeah, because of all the lost revenue that they yes. had. Yep. Well, I mean, think about Ohio State and the fact that their enrollment is over like 60,000 students at this, you know, <laughs> I said this yesterday, that's, that's like a small, you know, that's a couple small towns, yeah. uh, you know, 60,000 plus, and Notre Dame has a fraction of that. They've got what, a little over 10,000 in, in undergraduates. That, that yeah. Include, yeah. Well, they're under 10 in undergrads. Yeah, they it's like eight, eight right. and like and 11 half. until you add yeah. the graduate program into it. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's just a big difference in how Notre Dame needs to operate and what they require versus schools like Ohio State and some of these other massive state schools and the way they're doing things. And the other thing too is is Notre Dame, every time Notre Dame has a big building project, they 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 fund it before they build it. Like they go right. out and raise the revenue for it. It doesn't come out of the other thing. So they just operate in a completely different yes. universe the way they go about it. And it's and so frustrating to, right. at points. I will say that it is frustrating right. at times, right? Yeah. That they have to have the money in hand before they start a project and all these different things. That's, right. but it's smart. It's, it's not frustrating for me because I understand what it means. It, I, cause I, cause you understand the sacrifices they would have to then make right. because they'd have to then go chasing the, the TV money more. Keeps uh keeps all those guys in development employed over there, yes, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, I, there's we, a lot I know, of them. 
I know There's a, a few of, of those guys, and they yep. they are frustrated at times, but they are employed. Well, they better not be frustrated because if they just started just you know going out and getting max TV deals, then what do we need you for? Yeah, right. Or what do we need at least the size yeah. of this department? Pretty for? sure they don't think of it that way. But yeah, well, they need to. <laughs> they need to. Yeah, right. It's like all the it's all the people that like were anti football. I'm like, you guys realize the reason you make what you make at the University of Notre Dame is in large part because of the the fame that's brought by the football program, and it, and and that doesn't mean oh the TV money. It means Notre Dame's football program made the University of Notre Dame a national institution. Correct. And a worldwide institution in a lot of different ways. It was the football program that began that. Otherwise, they'd be like, I mean, there's some elite academic schools in the Chicago area, Mm -hmm. right? But most of the people don't know who the heck they are. Right. Because they don't have this giant, you know, famous football program. Absolutely. And, you know, that's that's the reality. And they've used it to their advantage. Absolutely. For the actual school itself, they've used football right. to their advantage. As, As they, they should. Absolutely, they should. Right. They've done a really good job of it. From a selfish standpoint, you talk about living within their means and all that. I wish they would live outside their means when it comes to paying some coaches from some other sports so that you could get really, you know. Well, names. but again, it's it's, you know. Why should we pay a coach X amount of dollars when that program doesn't generate X amount no, of dollars? I, totally. You know I mean? and that's, like, I get that's it. Where, I don't like it, but I get right. it. Right, and, that, and that's where some schools live outside their means is they're paying right. more into the program than they're getting out of it. Yeah, right. I totally get that. It's right. From a fiscal standpoint, I totally understand. I live that world. <laughs> Let me tell you. Mm-hmm. Five kids forces you to do that. All right, moving forward. <laughs> Rob Osgood with the super chat. Uh, no comment. I didn't know if there was one near him or not, but thank he's you just being nice. Rob, you're just man. showing his support. Rob, thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Great guy. That. We've got uh, a question here from Different Isle. Great name. Guys, what kind of personality do you think meshes best with Harry Heastand? I've been keeping an eye on Pancake Ancho and truly feel like it would have been a bad combo if he came to Notre Dame. I, the pancake honcho is uh, samson okalola for those okay. who aren't sure who that is sure. he's very much a social media figure m- compared to for an lineman right? right i mean for a lineman he you know he's not like a quarterback but so i think there's people to think that i don't think that would bother harry he stand as all as long as you are here's the personality that harry he stand wants are you coachable mm-hmm. are you a hard worker do you have some intestinal fortitude and are you strong-minded Right. If a kid liked being on social media, like if if Quentin Nelson w- had the personality at Notre Dame that he has now in the NFL, do you think Harry Heastan would have been enjoyed coaching him? And do you think it would have worked well? Yeah, it would have. Because, Sean, you remember when Quentin was a freshman and, and redshirt freshman and we're trying to interview him. And I mean, he would like I mean, he was incredibly uncomfortable and nervous. Right. Didn't like talking to the media and, and was was out of his element. Now you look at him. And he's a completely different person. But like, I mean, that didn't is, even is that changed. didn't even change <laughs> much by the you know no. by the end of his career no. at Notre Dame. It really right. took him getting you know outside. I, and I and I think that it you know maybe it helps where the structure is different in the NFL the way they run meet. You know, having like I went to Colts training camp a few years ago and got to kind of experience that. It's 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 a little bit different down there. I don't think they're completely being coached up about what to say all the time either. But you're absolutely right. You know, just just about you know he he did you know because even you know there was a few years ago when I was doing interviews for uh, the radio post game show, and here comes Quentin Nelson out on the field, and they kind of had it's like they shuttled these guys out on the field, and and they were supposed to be bringing him out to me. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, he's like going back up the tunnel. I'm like, Quentin, you know, over here, you know, radio interview. And he kind of gives me the the side eye and he's up the tunnel. You know, it's like he didn't want anything more than than he was absolutely told what to do, you know, as far as it went with with doing media type stuff. But you you talk to people around Indianapolis now, his work ethic hasn't changed, his coachability hasn't changed. None of that's changed. It's just he's kind of come out of his shell. So I think it's what's inside the kid that they care more about than his his external personality you know you yeah. can have guys who are quiet and reserved like quentin us uh, who aren't coachable who are who don't take hard coaching who aren't hard workers who aren't all those things and you're going to have some guys that are flamboyant and, and and outgoing that are also very hard workers and you know very coachable and all those kind of things so that's really more of what they care about i i don't i think we need to be careful not to to see like well harry heaston only likes guys with no personality that just want to come here and work every day i 
I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I mean, you know, look at Elijah Page and his big old hair. I mean, did you see the <laughs> Sullivan Absher, Sam Pendleton photo shoot that they took there in their visit with like their shirts off and stuff like that? Like those kids have some personality. It's just they may not be social media personalities, right? Well, and, and like Zach Martin, Mike McGlinchey, you know, the, 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 those were both guys in that he stand era, you know, the previous he stand era as well. And they're not necessarily, you know, like Zach Martin would sit and talk with you. You know, he had no problem sitting and talking and, and you know, giving you his his real thoughts on a lot of things. But at the end of the day, Zach Martin was really good at what he did and he took the coaching well. And, you know, he's he's essentially a technician of an offensive lineman on the field. And Mike McGlinchey, you know, a little bit more thoughtful maybe. And he kind of blossomed as he was here as well. But again, he wasn't, you know, kind of, you know, in that sort of cocoon, I guess, you know, right. keeping his personality in like Quentin Nelson. So they're, you know, they're all varying degrees of it. But I think at the end of the day, all three of those guys wanted to be great. And that was, you know, part of. And Notre Dame had to kind to of it. tone yeah. Liam Eikenberg down. Yeah. Right. That's, like, because yeah, remember his first too. interview experience, like we're just going to yeah. go there, beat their ass and get back on the bus and go home. And they're that's like, right. oh, <laughs> you know, we didn't see Liam the rest of the year. You know what, I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In the interview that's room, right. uh, you know, but, but. You know, but again, same wanted to work, wanted to be great, all that kind of stuff. So I think those are the those are the personality traits that Harry Heastan look like. How those are expressed publicly, I don't think he cares much about, yeah. in my opinion. And and I think we're gonna find that out this year because I mean Blake Fisher is very much an outgoing personality. And from everything I've heard, Blake has taken extremely well to coach Heastan and he loves pushing that kid because he thinks it can be great. That's it. Sean nailed it. If you want to be great and you're willing to allow me to push you to be great, you'll fit in here. I don't care what your personality is like. And that's the key at the end of the day. Vince, we have a little bit of an announcement. The, yep. uh, the, the board is is running slow, uh, but it is not – it is up. Uh, but don't everybody – I guess maybe don't everybody run there at once, but <laughs> you can find the, the Dante Moore Intel piece. It, it is up on the board now. So uh, just be a little bit patient. We do have it back up, but it is – we're still trying to work on getting the speed back up. So I I pre I apologize and, and – uh, ask for everyone's patience and forgiveness. Uh, but just we'll good get intel, Brian. Back and running, yeah. Just good intel. Well, it was weird. Like as soon as he committed, I went to the Google Anal Analytics and I was like, "Uh oh, this is going to be a problem." <laughs> no. Because like <laughs> the board started slowing down. I was like, "Wait a minute, what's going on? Like, uh, why is the board getting slow?" And then I realized like hundreds of people just all at once ran in the message board. And I was like, "Oh boy." So uh, we do like apologize. Oh. We appreciate the fact that your first thought was to run to Irish Breakdown. I do appreciate that and. Someday, you know, tomorrow's our one year anniversary of launching the message board. So it's still oh, kind of a baby or it's still a work in progress, right? but I promise you it'll be, it'll be worth it. And as I've said, we are, we, you know, th that's also part of the reason we haven't raised our rates and don't have no intention of raising our rates anytime soon. Part of it's for other reasons, but part of it is until we really get this board where I feel like it is where it needs to be and how it runs every day, you know, we're going to keep it where it is. But anyway, we have some super chats oh, here too. Vince. Oh. So we'll do what we normally do, Vince, which is like, I'll, bring up some super chats as we get them. And then you keep rocking and rolling with it. Love where your head is. All right, here we go. Zach Martin with a super chat. Thank you very much, Zach. Speaking of Zach Martin. Yeah, I know. Right. Perusing <laughs> the roster. Is it fair to say it is talent depth and experience wise best setup for a championship run in 22 and 24, 23 seems like a lot of rotation. Young guys will be the guys a year early. We got to get this transition year stuff out of our conversation yes. and out of our and out of our out of our vocabulary at Notre Dame, right? Like Clemson's last national title came when they had a true freshman at quarterback, a true a, a true freshman thousand yard receiver, a two a true sophomore thousand yard running back, and another true sophomore thousand yard receiver, right? Like we've got to get this. If you recruit big time players in this era of college football. Kids aren't staying for four and five years like they used to. Teams in general are just younger. These kids are exposed to so much more than they used to be because it, it's also about preparation. These kids are in seven-on-seven -seven tournaments nonstop. They're playing football year-round now. I don't actually like that, but it's the reality of it. These kids are so much more prepared to play right away. Strength and conditioning has changed not just in NFL and college football, but in the high school level. Kids are far more prepared to play younger Mm -hmm. than they used to be, and the game has changed. So, you know, you, you look at it and say, look, if you have talented players at a place like Notre Dame, you need to look at yourself as we're going to go out there and try to win all of our games. 
And and it's funny you say that, Zach, because there are some people say, no, 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 no. 22 is the transition year. Wait, wait till 23. And then you get to 23 and they would say exactly what Zach said. Well, we got a lot of young guys. Wait till 24. That, Vince, is what we call BK PTSD. Yes, because it was always, well, wait till next year. Yeah, wait, wait till, till next, next year. year. It's because yeah. I'm a Cubs fan and I'm a, I, I was a Brian it. Kelly, you know, I, I was a fan Except of Notre it Dame. wasn't lovable. And it was like, that's the <laughs> yeah, it was like, oh, just wait till next year. We're going to be good. This is a transition. <sighs> if you are a fan of Notre Dame and of what they're doing on the recruiting trail and Marcus Freeman and everything else, and if you want to be a fan of a top level team, there's no such thing as a transition year. There shouldn't be. Right. Transition mean me. Okay, maybe this year we're, we're maybe 10 and 2, but look, you're going to have a dynamic quarterback. I mean, right. maybe Sean, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I'm I'm dominating the time. I I be, we haven't talked about this. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. This not uh, notion of 22 is a transition year or maybe 23 is a transition year. What are your thoughts on this? No, I agree with what you're saying. You know, last year was supposed to be a transition year and look at what it turned out to be. You know, they were one you know, one loss away from being right back in the college football playoff or once one again. One win with, for Georgia or Auburn away. Yeah, from exactly. Being. Exactly. You know, the, the bottom line is they're going to be every year you go into a season in college football, you're going to have some questions. You know, one year, you know, last year you had big questions on the offensive line. I don't think there are many as question, you know, as many questions on the offensive line this year. It's always going to move around a little bit where you're going to have the questions. And you're exactly right. The recruiting, where the recruiting is going right now, the expectation is, well, you're just going to write off his freshman year and now, you know, he's going to go into his sophomore year and now he's going to be ready to play. You're expecting when when you've got those stars next to your name and, you know, you can always talk about the stars, but when you've got those next to your name, the expectation is a good chunk of those guys are going to be able to come in and at least contribute right away. So I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think you need to get rid of the notion of transition years and it's now you're reloading every year because again, the level of recruits that you're bringing in, there shouldn't be as much a drop off. Now it's on the coaches to get those guys ready to go and, and get out there and, and be on a team that's competing for championships every year. Could have said it better myself. Our buddy John A1 dropping it like it's hot. If Bracey's confidence is fully restored, can he play on the outside slash field pending the matchup? Could his athleticism be the key to an improved secondary? Well, I think Tariq was pretty good last year. I mean, he he was a he was a very underratedly good player for Notre Dame last year. I mean, can you think of a time where he got beat that didn't involve a pick play? Or he, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, against North Carolina. I thought he's pretty good. I, I just don't know if I see him at this point in time as being like an every down outside guy, partly because I think Notre Dame really likes what he brings to the slot. But he played outside last year too. This is the thing that we, we don't talk about. Cla uh, Clarence Lewis wasn't the only cornerback that played a lot of snaps last year. Tariq played a lot of snaps too. But I, look, at the end of the day, the key to an improved secondary in, in today's era is you've got to have three really good safety corners. And if Tariq is really good, and he's there, and Cam's really good, which we expect him to be, against Ohio State, against Clemson, against USC, again in the postseason against Alabama, against Oklahoma, even with Jeff Levy there instead of Lincoln Riley. In all those big games, with the exception of Georgia, you got to have three corners, and that's where we're at now. So, you know, Tariq stepping up is great, but I think Tariq was pretty decent last yeah, year. It's going to still be about Clarence Lewis or someone beating out Clarence Lewis. Either yep. Clarence Lewis gets better or someone beats Clarence Lewis out and plays at a high level. That ultimately is going to be the key to this thing getting turned around. Agreed. John has another question. He says, Marcus Freeman, as defensive coordinator, was trying to make the scheme so his players could play fast but sound. Do mm -hmm. you suspect Al Golden will be successful in getting the linebackers to the next level of playing fast and sound? I'll say one one area where, Mark, where Al Golden – has an advantage over Marcus Freeman from last year is he hit the pick of guys that he's going to have available to him automatically they're going to be faster and more sound. Yeah. I will say well, that. Sean Sean there's a lot more production returning this defense this year than there was last year. Yeah. Right. There's no question. Right. That's exactly, exactly yeah because now you know you're moving JD Bertrand over you know from Will to Mike, you know, the leading tackler a year ago, and you, you know, you're bringing Kaiser back, you're bringing, you, you've got Maris Leofau 
coming back. And that's that, you know, like when you're talking about fast and sound that, you know, the, the possibility of having Leah Fowl and Bertrand playing next to each other, just based on what we saw from, from Leah Fowl before the injury last year, that's that, that excites me quite a bit, you know, as, as a tandem, it, it probably going to be one of the better inside linebacker combos we've seen here in in yeah. several years you know yeah and and Vince views Zach uh, Jack Kaiser as being someone who's who's criminally underrated and the other thing we got to remember too is if you look at the names that Notre Dame lost losing Kyle Hamilton was a big loss from a name standpoint Kyle Hamilton played half the year and he's being replaced with a guy who was a former All-American so it's a little right. different when you lose a guy to the draft but you already lost that guy and you showed that you could you know, still go out and beat most of the teams on your schedule. So I think I think this defense is going to be very, very good. And I think the other thing, too, that, John, is Marcus Freeman, we didn't know it was going to be the case, but Marcus Freeman served as a bridge from Clark Lee to Al Golden. And what I mean by that is is, is Marcus Freeman brought in a completely different philosophy to defense than out than 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 um than Clark Lee and and how you coach it, the expectations, how you play. It led to a lot of big mistakes early in the year because there is a level of I, I want to say kind of like, you know, the football version of personal responsibility, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where, you know, hey, this is your job, but I need you to go make a play. Where Clark Lee's thing was, I don't care about you making a play. Do your job. I'll dictate who's going to make the play. If you're going to make a play, it's going to be within the framework of what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Where Marcus Freeman gives players a little bit more freedom to, to you know, within the system to go make plays. And, and so that's partly why we saw some mistakes last year. But it's much more of a dynamic defense. It's a much more of a versatile defense where Clark Lee was very much like, hey, let's just kind of line up and, and you know, do these type of things. And part of the reason he hired Al Golden, Sean, was not to replicate, this is what I did, here's my playbook, run it. But it's because they come from, the, Al Golden has a very similar view to how to play defensive football at a high level that Marcus Freeman had. And that's ultimately why he was hired, sure. which means yeah. Marcus Freeman served as the prep for what Al Golden's going to bring. Right. Yeah. There, there, there are a lot of similarities, but as we found out pretty early on, this isn't necessarily Al Golden running Marcus Freeman's defense, but there are enough similarities that it's not going to be the drastic change that you were talking about going from Lee to Freeman. Now, Freeman to Golden, there'll be some tweaks, but I think we're going to see kind of more a continuation right. of, of what we just saw. The, the tweaks will be schematic. Right. right. The philosophy will be the same. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Vince, you and I both know this, that's the key. It, it's like, you know, one coach may teach inside zone a little differently than another coach, but it's still inside zone. You're not right. changing to the V. Right. Exactly. Right. You exactly. Know? I mean, yeah. that's that's the reality. There'll be nuances, like you know, right. first step or you know, however yeah. you want to coach it. That's Golden fine. Might like might like four down right. more than three down. He might like more zone coverage compared to man coverage. It's going to be the same philosophy. He's just going to have different right. emphases and different play calls, yeah. and it's going to take on his personality. Where you know, Marcus Freeman has his set of calls on third down. Al Golden's going to have his set of calls on third down. It's going to come from the same philosophy. It's just going to right. you know look different, and sure. and that's that. The, so the the point is. The change from Freeman to Golden is going to be not a much of a change, whereas the change from Lee to Freeman was pretty seismic. Pretty drastic. On top yeah. of, you lost a lot of really experienced players from last year's team, and including losing guys that you were expecting to step into the starting lineup. You know, and that's that's another. I mean, you lost Dalen Hayes, you lost Adi Takumba Ogundiji, Maris Luafau gets hurt, Shane Simon gets hurt, who had started right. the year before. You lose a guy named Jeremiah Usukormo. I don't know if you guys have heard of him before. He played for Notre Dame for Didn't he win uh, some sort of an yeah, award? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you lose you lose Nick McLeod. I mean, you you know, you lost some pretty good football players, some pretty veteran football players, and you're replacing with in a, in a lot of instances guys who had not played a lot of football before. Right. JD Bertrand hadn't played a lot of football before, right? Jack right. Kaiser hadn't played a lot a ton. He played in 2020, but not a ton. Uh, you know, you look at Ramon Henderson, begins the year at corner, ends the yeah. year as a starting safety, right? Cam Hart was a receiver a year and a half before he steps into the starting lineup as your as your cornerback. Right. And now all, all those guys are now back with a year under their belt. And, you know, I think that's the thing that has a lot of a lot of people like me fired up is you were cha you were changing your scheme and your philosophy completely around last year. And you were doing it with a bunch of new kids and you went 11 and one. You know, who who was Isaiah? I mean, Isaiah Foskey had what five and a half career sacks coming into last year. Yeah. Right. And now right. he's coming in. You know, he had he had more forced fumbles last last year coming into this year. He had six forced fumbles last year. That's more career sacks 
than he had his first two years at Notre Dame, right? So he's a much more proven player as well. And look at Justin Adamiola, who broke out last year, right? right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a it's a much better, in my opinion, situation for Notre Dame overall. Got a super chat here from Fed Exile. Fed Exile. <laughs> Fed Dead. I don't know. I I apologize. Fad Dead Exile. Did Notre Dame really turn down? I think that's Faded Exile. Faded Exile. There you go. <laughs> okay. See, I yeah. Public I, school I, education, everybody. Too. Whoa, 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 whoa! I did not have a public <laughs> school education. I, 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 you're you're public teaching public education. <laughs> <laughs> that's worse. <laughs> I need capital letters. I need capital letters in space. I, Sean and I are looking right. at Vince like, uh, what? <laughs> I, I think, this, you know what? This all stems back to the fact that you have no baseline of music knowledge. If you knew that's anything right. about music, you'd be able to read that. That's that's, that's just that's, my that's that's my fair. thought on that. That's probably <laughs> fair, yeah, actually. I, I, I've got the 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 one guy who's edited, E-D-E-D. Uh, yeah. I think that's yeah. like in my head, yeah. and then I saw that, and it was so now you're looking for <laughs> different ways to... Exile. Exile. (laughs) Is that French? (laughs) It's a great prize. (laughs) Okay, back to Faded Exiles question. (laughs) Appreciate it. All right. Did Notre Dame really turn down Christopher Vizina wanting to commit because of Dante? No, that's false. Uh, They turned down Chris Vizina visiting. And there was thought he might commit. I never bought that. I, I never thought he was going to commit. I think Clemson was a much stronger player all along than a lot of people thought. Now, could Notre Dame have gotten Chris Fazina? Maybe. But no, they 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 he was not going to come and commit. It was he was going to come. They thought they had a chance at him. But remember, Dante Himmore had just committed like yes. a week and a half before his visit, Chris Fazina's visit, right? So you're going to bring a kid on. When Dante had just given you a a, a silent commitment, that's and not a genuine thing. And at the time, Dante, from what I'm told by sources, had was talking to Notre Dame about going public in April. Yeah, early April. So yes, at the time, Notre Dame did pass on other quarterbacks because they had Dante and, in the fold. In Notre Dame's defense, if you have a commitment at a position where you're only taking one player, right, whether it's public or otherwise. It is disingenuous of Notre Dame to have this kid, another kid, come on campus and recruit him like he's the guy that you want. Right. That's a, that's, mm-hmm. I, I actually give Notre Dame credit for canceling that visit because they're not going to lead the kid on. I, mm-hmm. I people need to understand, and I'm, I'm not. This is nothing against Faded Exile, but people need to understand what was going on behind the scenes and why they canceled certain things and they did certain things. They had this kid in their back pocket. He committed to them, so. I, I have no problem with them canceling that visit. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't either. I don't either. Okay. Now, we can always, because we can always do the hindsight 2020 thing, right? Of course. I mean, we can always say, well, if you didn't own this, I, I would have made this call in third and five. Well, okay. Sure. We didn't have that data. We didn't have, you know, the back to the future, you know, sports almanac option to come back and, Ooh, you know, well start placing games on bets. You know what I mean? For those people that are younger, Grace watch the movie. Sports. It's really good. Almanac. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But, you know, look, they made a decision. They went with it and it didn't work. Okay. Now it's time to regroup, move on and see what you're going to get. It reminds me a lot of the situation when Notre Dame put all their eggs in the, the Will Shipley basket. At the time, I didn't like that decision because I thought there was other good backs on the right. board. Right. But look what they ended up doing. They ba- they recovered and they went and got Logan Diggs and Audrey Estime. Ended up being okay. And if they get one of the kids that's on the board that, that, that I think is going to be on the board now – Again, I, I think they'll be okay. Right. You know, so it, it's a big loss. It stings, but I think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to be okay too, based on the film I watched this morning. So, yeah. Well, okay. I mean, they got to get those kids, right? I mean, that's no, the absolutely thing. I mean, 100%. But I get those saying, kids, right? Those options are really, really good options to have. That That's, yeah. that's all I'm saying. It's not yeah. like they're left standing in the cold, potentially. Right. Okay. God, country, Notre Dame, barbecue, and coffee. Still need to change that last word. <laughs> okay. Part one, Al Golden is my favorite coaching hire of the offseason, excluding Marcus Freeman, of course. I expect us to continue our great defenses with him and even get better. Do you see him being like a Venables, like Dabo had for a while? I believe with his experience of head coach and NFL already, he won't leave unless he gets his dream job. Thoughts? Sean, you want to take first crack at that? Man, that's pretty deep. You know, so, I mean, 
That's is how the, mailbags go, Sean. I know. This is why I've warned you. Uh, 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 here's, a, here's a fun fact. I don't know if I've ever told you guys this. Brent Venables and I are from the same hometown, Salina, Kansas. I didn't know that. And wow. I didn't know that. His older brother, Kirk, um, he and I kind of had a had a little rivalry for the same girl for a while. Nice. So wow. that's like that's like I, I met Brent once, but you know, he was still pretty young in high school, you know, but so that's like who won? I did. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's how we roll, baby. I don't know that's why right. anybody had to ask. That's right. <laughs> uh, um for the short term, I guess. You like she, she she never she never went back with him anyway. Okay. So yeah. Okay. But that's all um, that matters. That's all that's that right. That's right. So I guess he's asking, is is Al Golden gonna be around for a long time the right. way Brent Venables was around for a long time? I, I you know where Al Golden is in his, you know, like he, I believe his experience of head coach in the NFL already. He wouldn't leave unless he gets his dream job. You know, he's, it's been a while since he's been a head coach. He's at kind of that age, you know, he's more my age bracket than, you know, like Vince's age bracket, even, you know, which is, you know, early 40s as, a, you know, like I'm mid 50s. So I would think that if Al Golden, had some success and, you know, they're really kind of churning this thing around that if he gets an opportunity to, to especially to be a power five head coach again somewhere, yeah, I sure. wouldn't think he's going to turn that down. You know, I wouldn't think that he's necessarily going to stay here for the long term. Now that's yeah. just what I would think, be, you know, and like you hear him talk and, you know, he's, he's had these opportunities. He obviously came back to college after being a position coach in the NFL. So he gets to be a coordinator again, and this is the first time he's been a coordinator for a long time. What's it been, Brian? Like 2004, 2005, I think it was, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah 2005, 2005 at, at Virginia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I I think that, you know, if they have the kind of success that we think that that he can have and he gets an opportunity to, to move on and be a Power 5 head coach, I would think that he would take it. I wouldn't think that he's going to be like a, you know, a 10- or 12-year guy right. at Notre Dame. I think in a lot of instances, I, I do think I do think he would be like Venables in that. I, I, look, I don't I don't think he'll be at Notre Dame as long as Venables was at Clemson because Venables is two years younger now than Al Golden is now. So he was much younger when he got the job at Clemson. It was a decade ago. Right. So, but the other part of it is I, I do think, however, that he could be like Venables in that I don't think Brent Venables left Clemson this offseason because he wanted to leave Clemson and was ready to be a head coach. It was the job he would a job he coveted came open. Right. right. A big job. Uh, he wouldn't have left. Me. Right. He wouldn't have left for Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State. If Matt, if let's say Matt Campbell got a big time job, right? Let's say Harbaugh gets the you know, the Vikings job and Michigan goes and hires Matt Campbell. Brent Venables isn't leaving Clemson to go be the head coach at Iowa State. There was a number of jobs he would take and Oklahoma was one. And remember, he was in Oklahoma for a long time and had some yeah. really good football teams when he coached under Bob Stoops. And so yep. I think the right job came along. I do think because of what happened at Miami that I do think Al Golden will be a little bit more picky. He's not going to just sure. take a power five job. John Agreed. didn't say that he would take any power five job. Right. But like, let's say James Franklin leaves in two years and, and Notre Dame's rolling and doing great. Yeah. I think Al Gold would strongly consider going back to his alma mater. And, and, you know, he's a New Jersey guy. He played at Penn state. Yeah. I think he would look at that. Do I think if Pitt came up and he'd take that might be a little more skeptical there. Cause I do think at his age, he, I think he would want to go somewhere that he doesn't have to rebuild a program and then just to be good, not great. I think it would it would be like Venables there where it'd have to be a good power five job. Like he's not leaving for Vanderbilt like Clark Lee did, I guess is the point no. I'm trying to make. And he's he's gonna have more visibility here as the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame than even even as a linebackers coach for a team that went to the Super Bowl mm -hmm. like Cincinnati. There, there's obviously gonna be more visibility. And again, now you're a coordinator, so so things have changed. So you have success, he's gonna have some opportunities once again, yeah. especially with the guy with the kind of yeah. background that he does already have. Right. And, and I will also say that if Notre Dame has the success that we all envision that is possible at Notre Dame under Marcus Freeman, you're going to see a lot of turnover from the assistant coaches Yeah. because when you're good, people poach you, you know, and you take that step up job. And there's, I think there's going to be, we're going to be talking about coach openings a lot, you know, each off season. I, I think that that's a reality of a team that is really, really good. I mean, how, how often does Alabama change offensive coordinators? 
well, they change offensive coordinators because those guys go off and get head coaching jobs. You know what I mean? Like that, I think that's a reality that Notre Dame fans are going to have to get used to, you know, and the guys that remember, remember how excited we were at the time that Notre Dame, that Marcus Freeman was going to keep almost the entire staff. And then those guys left. But they all left for. We didn't see that coming either. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but they all left for better jobs, and so right. you can't you can't necessarily hold that against those guys. That's just the reality of being part of a good program. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I think people need to understand that as well. Okay, good question. Do, do, yeah, really good question. Do you have a, a one you want to throw up? Or yeah, do, I'll, I'll bring some up as I as as okay. they come along. But I, I have one that I'm getting ready to bring up. Yes. All right, here we go from Mark E. Stewart for the super chat. Thank you very much. Why is it okay that Notre Dame operates so differently and doesn't need the TV money, but we don't have the best facilities? If we are the biggest brand in college football, why not have tops in everything that can be offered? Go get the money. Okay, I I think this is a great question, and I would like to address it, Sean. And and if you have something you add that, I'd love to hear it. But here here's the thing. Sure. Notre Dame not having great facilities for all those years had nothing to do with them not having the money to do so. It had it had hmm. to do with them having the desire and to to want to actually be right. the best in those areas. Correct. It's never been a, a money issue. I mean, Notre Dame has a $20 billion endowment. The point to that is not that they could just take from that to go build a stadium, but it's fundraising isn't a problem at Notre Dame. You know, and part of the reason their endowment's at $20 billion is because they did some really smart investments. Notre Dame understands how to make and raise money <laughs> is the point. Yes. And and what I would say is is when Jack Swarbrick took over in in 2009, you know he kind of sat back for a year. I think wisely said, "Let's let Charlie coach this last year and see how he does." Because then it gives you a chance to evaluate everything. And pretty much early on, Jack Swarbrick made the decision to say, "We've got to we've got to start competing with the best." Notre Dame has a way of doing it. And you look at the Crossroads Project; they raised money for that at a pretty phenomenal level when you consider how yeah. much money they had to raise for that price they it's did almost it a half quickly. a billion dollars they get quick like, that right. was fast they raised it quick and they built it relatively quick to yeah. now their name stadium is a phenomenal up to yeah. state-of-the-art place now oh uh and, it, and, and it's it i mean even when you get into the bowels of it right. you know like sean and i had to go into like the tv or not the tv but like the studio area mm-hmm. where they have the audio visual stuff it's first rate, man. Like they got some nice yeah. stuff. And I know Sean can speak to that more specifically, but I was impressed as I was walking through there. Yeah. It's the recruiting facility. Yes. It's everything, right? The press box. I mean, everything about it is, is, you know, the, the scoreboard. Well, they don't have light shows. That, that, that's not a money thing. That's a choice because right. guess what? Nerdy decided, Hey, let's have one. And, and that was freaking awesome. Yeah. Right. Go ahead, Sean. Well, the choice that's, right. that's, that's the key word right there because, you know, we talk about the tradition of Notre Dame and the tradition of independence and all these different things. And, you know, for a long time, there was kind of that tug of war between, okay, we don't, we shouldn't have to do this because we're Notre Dame. Notre Dame should sell itself, you know, that kind of sure. mentality. Like when I got here 22 years ago, it'll be 22 years in October, that field, you know, well, <laughs> not a field now where the practice fields are and where the the new you know practice facility and the lacrosse stadium and the soccer stadium when i got here it was pretty much what you know a wide open field over there that was the outdoor football uh you know practice fields and then there was you know the soccer quote-unquote stadium that looked more like a high school stadium and there was you know there was a softball field that basically looked like a high school softball field. Well, look at, you know, the track facility wasn't there. All those different things, you know, so they've done a lot. You know, the Goog wasn't even there. In, in So they've they've shifted their philosophy. And again, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, they they go out and they fundraise to get those. They've, they've right. you know, so there's, again, there's kind of been that tug of war between, you know, the tradition and now there's an arms race, obviously, going on in college athletics where all these other places where these kids like, you know, Dante Moore, CJ Carr, whoever they happen to be are, are going to these other places and they see all these shiny bells and whistles. Right. And Notre Dame doesn't necessarily still have that because right. they do want the tradition to be part of their thing. So, right. so 
they've done a lot to get to where they are yeah. right now. I, I mean, guess. they you have know, there's one been of the a big best, mindset. Shit. Yeah, yeah, they have one of the best indoor facilities in college oh, football right it's now. Beautiful. Right. You know? It's beautiful. It's right. beautiful. I mean, they have they have an indoor facility and then three full practice fields. Correct. They have four practice fields at Notre Dame right now. Yes, right. two turf, two grass. Correct. Uh, three turf, two grass. Three turf, two grass. Well, because yeah. the the one indoors is turf, and then the two. Right. In the fence are turf, and then the outside so one. So it's three turf, one yeah. grass. Yep. Okay. Three so turf, three one turf, grass. one grass. Yep. Which makes sense because you now play on turf most of the time. You have yeah. a new turf field. You have well, yeah, almost all the time. Yeah. I mean, almost ever, except some of the ACC schools. Like Pitt. Yeah. Right. You know, you've th- th- you've talked that the indoor facilities being built up. This this notion that Notre Dame doesn't have big time facilities is really outdated. It really yeah. it really is. It's it's and it became outdated quickly. That's the thing is when Brian Kelly started, it was very much a real thing. I mean, it yeah, really absolutely. Was. Absolutely. Yeah. Agree. Uh, in, 20, in 2012, it was a real thing. And and it started with the field. And and so but the thing is, is they don't they don't need to take the TV money to do that. Notre Dame could raise more. And if Notre Dame needed a project, that was going to cost 200 million dollars. They could raise more in a year through the development office, who, by the way, they do a phenomenal job. You know, no, they, they may do. complain about having to work and all that. Kind of <laughs> stuff. But but I know some that love what they do yes. and, and they do a phenomenal job because they don't just raise money for football projects. They raise well, money and for that's, academic. And, and that's a really good point because over the last decade, has there been one period where there hasn't been construction on that campus of them Somewhere. building a new building? Right. I mean, right. there is right now. They're right. Building, and it's like all... <laughs> they raised that money. Yes. And if they needed, if they needed a hundred million dollars next year, Sean, you know, the, oh, let's take the TV deal. Cause we need this money to build this. Notre Dame could raise it quicker than they could get it from. They could get the, it. Big 10. You Absolutely. know, again, just the, just some of the interactions I've had with some former baseball guys over the past couple of months between the world series and the 2002 team having their, their uh, reunion. And, and one of those guys working in the development office, you know, just, just those conversations have told me, you know, there there are people lining up to give money. When they need to get money, right. they can go out and get Crazy. money. Right. You know, so give, give hey guys, money. I've had a great time doing this. Uh, I've got a I've got to check out though. So See you, Sean, IB Nation Sports Talk Monday six o'clock. Vince will be there. I'll be there too. See you guys. See you. Have a good weekend. <laughs> so Vince, I I do think it's important though that we that we put a, a bow on this one because I, I think Mark's question is valid. I, I think, think it's legit because we hear it all the time about yes, the facilities and and, 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 I, and I would just say like you know it, it it's a valid it, it has been a valid concern for a long time at Notre Dame. My only thing is is here's the deal, Mark. If let's just say that Notre Dame joined the Big Ten and got a hundred million dollars a year, just for argument's sake, if the administration from twenty years ago was still around. They would take that money and put it somewhere else. Right. They wouldn't use it for fo- yes, football. Yes, that's correct. They'd still have old facilities and an old locker room and an outdated this and an outdated that. Notre Dame's locker room now. They took. The, they've they've done such a phenomenal job. And this was my concern. Are they going to lose the traditional right. feel? Like I don't think tradition is a, a building that's hundred years old. Right. That's fine for the Basilica and all that. But like of as course. far as athletics, I don't. I, Newt Rockney, you and I have talked about this. If Newt Rockney was you know still coaching at one hundred and thirty years old. You know what I mean? Like he'd have been the first person, or if during his era there were scoreboards and turf fields, and he'd have been the first person yep. on those things. He was all that's about innovation. He was. He was I mean, that's what Notre Dame Stadium was when it was built. It was, right. the, you know, it was the biggest right. and the best. Right. And so I think there was this, it was, so it wasn't a money, it's never been a money thing, Mark. That's the thing that, that I think people don't understand. It was a, what are you prioritizing? And in the past, they would take, you know, the football revenue would then be used to pay for so many other things. Well, now that they are doing such a good job raising money for other things that they don't necessarily need to to do that as much anymore. But the football team can get what they need to get. They would you know, it would just take maybe a year longer right. to do it uh, in, in, for the massive like four hundred million dollar projects like the like the Crossroads project. But it would get done. Right. And like th- right now, they're already working on the Goog. There's a, yes. a huge renovation is going to happen, but they're just fundraising for it. And it sounds like they're gutting it. Like it, it, they're right. pretty much starting from scratch, which right. which is necessary, in my opinion. I mean, they built that when Charlie was here. And so they do need to do that. There, there are certain things that Notre Dame is doing with their football program that they don't really have the facilities to do. They're, they're, they're kind of like scratching areas out and doing certain things. And, and, and um, the, the uh, the eating areas and all of those things, but they've got a beautiful building. They just have to 
repurpose it a little bit. That, mm-hmm. That's basically what it is. They need to repurpose it, and they're doing that. But again, it takes a little bit of time. And they've got a beautiful indoor facility, man. You walk recruits into there, and it's like, okay, yeah, this is yeah. this is top notch. Right. So, so again, I I think it's a priorities thing, not a money thing. That's Agreed. all I'm saying. Right? Absolutely. Like, I, I, they don't need that money, and, and, and they and never did. What makes them different is that these other programs are living, like I said, they're living outside their means to where if they don't make that money, they can't pay salaries. They can't right. pay, you know, that kind of thing. And and again, that's what that's why it's so many people. I mean, even to a degree, Notre mm-hmm. Dame had to 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 scale down. And they did staff when they went to COVID. Yeah, they everybody did. got hit by that. But some people were hit more long term, whereas Notre Dame has been able to recover very quickly right. in a lot of different ways uh, during that period of time. But, um, you know, so that that's where it comes from. I mean, it's a great question, but I, but I just think that there's a there's a lot of things that 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 exist right now and in, in what we believe to be true that just isn't true anymore. Right. Uh, and it's been a relatively recent thing. And you know, is Notre Dame going to continue to, you know, redo things over and over again? No, because I don't think you need to. And ultimately, I don't think Notre Dame, if Notre Dame doesn't redo the indoor facility in five years, and it's, you know, other people, they're not going to lose recruits because of that. Right, exactly. Because it is still, if they were still trying to practice in, was it Loftus? Loftus. Loftus then, yeah, Loftus. that would be a problem, right? right? But they're just... That's just not because the, the Loftus got outdated. There, there's no doubt about yeah. that. The Loftus right. got outdated. Oh gosh, I mean, Lou Holtz was practicing in Loftus, We're and correct. it was old, it was and from a loose emoji it used to tell me it was old then. Right, right. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they didn't even have full end zones. You know, right. I mean, it, it was definitely outdated. And I, I always remember watching Tyler Newsom punt inside Loftus. That was always fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it just yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It was ridiculous. So and and the new indoor facility is also used for other things too. I mean that's where they held Marcus Freeman's press conference. They have recruiting right. events in there. The soccer team uses it for games. So I mean it is a well used building and it's beautiful. So yep, yep. Oh, got we a got a super chat here from Steve Rolf. Thank you very much, Steve. Really appreciate and he said, is it. That. Still a Friday free for all? Yeah, uh, yeah. Still I rolling, mean man. you couldn't see the Friday free for all because we had three guys in here, but it says it now. Yeah. Friday free for all, yep. baby. Gotta love it. Another super chat from Patrick Tolan. Any more thought on car reclassing? Also, to the Twitter tough guys, let's remember, more is an 18-year-old kid, be the adult. Yeah, if you're tweeting at Dante Moore today, just stop. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Person. Yeah, come just on. Give me a break. He's, and he's not an 18-year-old kid. He's a 17. He's 17, kid. exactly. He's still a, so, technically a child. I don't care so. if he was 20. Just leave, leave him alone. Let him. He made the best decision that he thought that he needed to make for himself and the people around him. Whatever it is, what it is. I don't care what the reasons are. He made it. Yeah, he 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 made made the decision. Can we be adults? It is. is. Yes, we have to be adults. And as far as the car reclassifying thing, uh, I'll let you take it. I know you put some stuff on the message board, and I didn't. I don't know if I don't know how you wanted. I personally don't want him to reclassify, but if he makes the choice to reclassify, then I'll support that. I'm a believer in freedom of choice and freedom of opportunity. And if that's something he chooses to do, then go for it, young man. I'm in general, just in theory, a a fan of kids getting to enjoy their high school experiences. I think there's a lot of maturing that goes on during them. There's a lot of things that you experience during high school, good and bad that, that, that help mold you into the person that you're going to become someday. And and I'm, I'm all for that, but if he makes a choice to do it, then he'll do it. Uh, What I don't like is when kids are pressured into those kind of things. And I think schools do that. That's not what's happening here with Notre Dame. Right. I think CJ Card knows if he wants to reclassify, he can. They would accept that. But right now, the fact that Notre Dame is, in fact, reaching out to other 2023 20, quarterbacks tells me that right now CJ is still not. leaning towards not doing so. And Notre Dame's not pushing it as right. well. I think it's a, right. two, it's a two-way street, right? right? I mean, I think everybody – Yeah, because if you push him to do something he's, he doesn't want to do, then he's just going to say, fine, I'm going to go to some school that's – Right. You know. That's cool with what I want. I mean, that's – absolutely. Right. right. My turn? Nope. I'll just, oh. say, I'll just say this real quick. Uh, okay, I get asked good. this a lot. Savage Science Fitness with a oh. super chat. Thank you. Brian, do you plan on launching a phone app for iPhone anytime soon or will it be easier for me to join the board uh, and go there that way? Look, we're still trying to get the message board figured out. And I'm not going to launch a bunch of projects. Um, you know, look, we're, we're not as part, we're not part of it. Our message board is not part of a network. We're not part of the rivals network and and the or the 247 network where they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars committed towards tech people that can do these things, right? Like this is all coming out of my pocket. You know, the message board came out of my pocket, right? It can't, all these things would have to come out of my pocket. 
And right now we're just not there. We're not even a year. Tomorrow will be a year since we lost the message, launched the message board, right? It's a work in progress, right? Other boards have been around for decades, you know, and, you know, we're, we're working on it, but I'm not going to jump into other projects. So like I said before, until I, the message board is where I want it to be. I'm doing one thing at a time. And, you know, cause I'm not, I'm, I'm doing this long term. I mean, this is going to be our thing. We're not doing this. You know, I'm not building this up so I can quickly sell it to somebody else, make a ton of money and then peace out and go do something else. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> this is, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Right. And so if it, if it means that we got to build it slowly, we will. And that's what we've tried to do. Now we've gotten people on board a lot faster than we thought, which has been part of the problem. <laughs> you know, we've grown too right. fast, which a good is, problem, I mean, but yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, you know, and, but, and, and most people are patient about it. Most are, some aren't. And if you're not, I understand it. It's your money. You can do with it what you want. I respect that. But, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, speaking of living inside our means, I'm, I'm not going to spend money on a project that I can't afford Yeah. at this point right. in time. When right. we get to that point in time, we'll get there. I mean, I would, I, would, I will want to have an app someday. It's just sure. right now. But like, there. but peeking behind the curtain, it costs a lot of money to develop an app. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it's not a cheap endeavor. It's not just like, you know what I want to do? Right. I want an app today. Like it, 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 right. it costs some coins. So yeah, like right now I got to decide, okay, is my next full-time hire going to be another recruiting person, a team person, or am I going to have to hire a tech person to, you Deal know, with all the stuff? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's the reality of it. Yep. So it's. Again, good good problem to have, but still a problem. So, yeah. John Wayne's Winchester, love that name. In regard to yesterday's question about places that you would like to see a game, I didn't hear you mention Tiger Stadium. Wouldn't a night game in Death Valley be prime viewing? Just think of no. the food. I, I, I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of of Cajun food. It yeah. tastes okay, but it's kind of like you know. Mexican food. I I love Mexican food. Mexican food doesn't love me. <laughs> I like spicy things. Spicy things don't love me. Yeah. But the other thing is, I mean, I've heard horror stories about what it's like to be an opposing fan at Tiger Stadium. Especially if you're an opposing fan with darker skin than I have. I've heard it's even worse for them. Uh, I've heard it's a horrible place to watch a game. So, no, I have no interest in going to Tiger. And I'm assuming Tiger Stadium is talking about LSU. LSU is what I'm assuming yeah. as well. Yeah, there's I, other Tiger Stadiums. That's just, true. You know, uh, but, but, but he I, said I, Death Valley and Tiger Stadium together, so yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. But I, the only thing I like about LSU is I do like their midfield logo. I, I think that's, that's cool, but that's great on TV. Exactly, I don't need, and I don't need to be there and deal with all that stuff. To you deal took with. the words need, right out of my mouth. I don't need I have, beer poured on me. I don't need batteries yeah. thrown at me. I'm I'm good. I have no desire to go there in any way. I didn't before, and I definitely don't now. So I, yes, I'll, I'll, I will say that. Yes, God, country, Notre Dame, barbecue, and coffee. Who has more pressure on them to win on September 3rd, Ryan Day or Marcus Freeman? Is it as simple as Ryan Day because he is not a first year head coach? Ooh, what are your thoughts on that, Vince? My that my first in, my first inclination was Ryan Day because I think Marcus Freeman has an instant pass, okay? Because A, it's his first official game with his staff, his team, etc. He's going on the road against a top 5, top 3 potential, you know, team. No one expects him to win. He's a two touchdown underdog. If he wins, it's amazing. If he loses, it's expected. So mm -hmm. I, I do. I think the pressure is more on Ryan Day. He's the more established coach. He's got the better team on paper, and everybody expects him to win. So if he doesn't win, that's a huge red flag. Right. If you're a Ohio State person, I, I look. I, I think there's always more pressure on the person who's been in a place the longest, right? Like I think there's. <clears throat> If Marcus Freeman loses to Ohio State, he's got a bunch of games to kind of right get back on track and rebuild his reputation. Yes. If if you know, and and, and again, you, you know, with what he's doing recruiting and all that kind of stuff, a win helps, but a win doesn't define the program. If you're Ryan Day, you're now going into what year four, mm. and and you get beat at home in an opener by a first year head coach who you've okay. dominated on who, whose program you've dominated on the recruiting trail and for I, the previous decade. And I will also say uh, you lose your opener again. Right? Didn't they lose right. to Oregon? No, it was in their opener. That was, was in their was, opener. Was, okay. No, no, they they it okay. was their home opener, I believe. Okay, but it wasn't their opener. They played Minnesota to start the season last year. Fair enough. And, and they were losing when Minnesota starting running back got hurt. I think Ohio I State would have eventually won the game, but uh, yeah, but you know they, they they struggled out of the game. Ohio State hasn't been a great September team. Not that Notre Dame has either. I mean, they barely sure. beat Florida State Toledo last year in September. Yeah, good it's just, point. Just making the point that. You know, it's early in the year and teams are – who Notre Dame is going to be in November and who Ohio State's going to be in November are going to be 
look way different than what they are in September. Sure. You know, and, and, and if, and if people think that, that they're just going to go out there and Marvin Harrison's going to look like Garrett Wilson in the opener, they're, they're kidding themselves. Just like if Notre Dame fans think that Tyler Buckner's going to go out there in the opener and look like, you know, Joe Montana against Houston in the second half of the cotton bowl, they're kidding them. You know what I mean? Like whatever. The <laughs> right. Maybe, uh, you know, these are, these are teams that are going to be works in progress. They're going to be very good, but they're both going to be works in progress. And if Notre Dame beats Ohio state, Ohio state's still going to be a great team next year and vice versa. I think to answer the question, however, I do think it's a bigger perception hit if Ryan day loses in year four, to a guy coaching what's essentially his first game as the head coach. You yes. Know, it's the first chance to coach with his staff, with his right. you know, whole offseason and all that kind of stuff. I think the perception wise, I think it's much more important for Ryan Day. Now, if it was at home for Notre Dame, I might change my tune because you know you need to win your first home game and all that. Maybe change my tune. But I think in this instance, the 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 older guy, I, I think always yeah. is, is, is not, not you know, I think he's that much older, but you know, he's been there long. But yeah, he's, yeah, he's more probably. established. Absolutely. Yeah. No question. John's got a two-parter here, Brian. Yeah. So. I want to. I want to. I want to oh. res- respond to this because uh, Archer, Ohio State fan, said Ryan Day has pressure on him every game. It comes with the job. Freeman is in the same level of job, but I don't think that's the that. I don't think that's where the you know, Archer. The question is coming from, in my opinion. I think the question is is more coming from the standpoint of you know the 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 the, per, the pressure of what the game would mean, the perception sure. of what it would mean, and I do think that there's always more on. It's like it's like you know, like is there pressure on them every game? Yeah, if you're at Ohio, State, you got to win every game. If you're Notre Dame, you have to win every game. But there's some games where like the pressure is greater, right? Like look at John Cooper. Look at John Cooper's record at Ohio State was pretty darn good. He had some really great teams. But why was he considered a failure at Ohio State? Because he couldn't beat Michigan. There's that one team, and then the one year he beats Michigan, they lose to Michigan State and don't play for title, right? Like it's how you perform. Brian Kelly. Why are so many people like us down to Brian Kelly? Because he won a ton of games, could win the big ones. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think this would be one of those things where with the way Notre Dame is recruiting right now, and, and they're finally starting to actually win some battles against Ohio State. They're not going to win them all or anything close to it, but they're starting to win some. Then you lose at home to that Notre Dame team, and people realize, hey, maybe this Freeman guy can coach too. I think it's more about the perception and where your program is and the questions of, for example, let's say Notre Dame this year goes out and makes a playoff run. There will be some that will say, you know, hey, you had Brian Kelly's players, which would be accurate. It was 100% accurate. Right? Yeah. And then if, like, let's say Marcus Freeman's first two or three years, Notre Dame's just really good. But then years in four and five and six, Notre Dame starts to slide down. See, so he won with Kelly's players, but when it came sure. about him building the team his way, he wasn't able to do it. And I think that's the territory Ryan Day is starting to enter. It's just now kind of his team now. It's You can't say, well, he's got to overcome this from Urban or benefit from this from Urban. It's now his team. And if they don't take a step forward, it's kind of like, is this who he is? Sure. You know, and so I think Marcus Freeman's not in there yet. In three years, it'd be a different story. And I think that's kind of where we're coming from with that one. But big picture, of course, there's always pressure yeah. to win at their name. And there's always pressure to win Ohio State. Absolutely. I think that's where that question was coming from. Yeah. In my opinion. Yep. I agree completely with that. Am I up? Yes. Just w- if I don't pull something up okay. right away, just go to the next question. <laughs> we've, okay? we've been doing yeah. we've been comboing up. All right. Uh, John's got a two-parter here. Penn State joining the Big Ten was a bit before my comprehension of college sports, but I thought the ACC made the first big conference move, taking the top of the Big East in 2004. Miami, Virginia Tech, and Boston College. Florida State, Miami, and Virginia Tech had played for the national title in the five previous years to the move. Then... Uh, you and FSU got hit. Sorry, didn't with, mean to do that. That's okay. Got hit with sanctions, and the Orange Bowl was destroyed. Back when we would have never thought the ACC could fall. I mean, that's kind of why I say like this notion that that the Big Ten and the SEC are going to do all these things, and then they're just going to, you know, everyone's going to die. Maybe, but that better happen pretty quickly because, you know, football cyclical in a lot of ways. Vince. Yeah, I agree. And. You know, to me, when when I look at where those questions go, did you just unstar them? I just unstarred them. Yeah. Okay. I was still reading through the first one again. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, I yeah. So I, I what was the first part? Of his it was question? just a, it was just about Penn State going, but then but but he was saying that the ACC made the first big move, yeah. and then the Big Ten kind of well, no, no, the Big Ten State made in. the first move actually. So so the Big Ten actually, Penn State made the first move. Penn Penn State joined. 
basically committed to the Big Ten in 1990 is, I believe, when that happened. And I'd have to go back and look. I think Miami was – like Penn State officially didn't start, I think, to like 92, but they made the decision well before that. So I, I, I'd have to go back and look. John, you could be right. Uh, but I always thought that it was Penn State that made that first move. I, and I've kind of been back and forth because then we were kind of, and then you know my, Miami and Penn State were the first two. Uh, you know, so so right here, uh, Miami joined the Big East in October 1990. Let me see when Penn State joined the Big Ten. Let me find that specific date of that. Um, Penn State joins the Big Ten. Just give me one second. This is Google searches. Uh, they, they, it was 1990 as well. I'm trying to see the date of when they did it. It was, um, looks like they did it in June. So, or no, I'm sorry. That's a different deal. Here, let's see, 1990. Let's see what the date was. But it was around the same time, but I thought Penn State actually made the move first. So, but anyway, they both happened at the same time. And then Penn State, um, then Florida State quickly followed to join the ACC. And that was the interesting thing is they all joined different leagues, right? That's the fascinating thing is they all left to join a different league. Miami went to the Big East. Penn State went to the Big Ten. And Florida State went to the ACC. They were all independents. Yeah. And so, like, they didn't go from – like, that shakeup wasn't about teams leaving leagues. That shakeup was teams no longer being independent. Right. That's when kind of independence – I don't want to say it died, but – It died. Much- it. I mean, because it, it was, it was then it was basically Notre Dame. Yeah, right. Exactly. It I was mean, Notre Dame and like Navy. Right. Well, I mean, it's like you start to see like more teams started to kind of leave over yeah. the next four or five years. But I mean, Penn State, Miami, Florida State, Notre Dame were the power independents yeah. back then. Right. Exactly. And, you know, we're just consistently top five teams. And so, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely it, it definitely shook things up. Sure. Uh, Penn State joined in June of 1990. So Penn State was like three months ahead of Miami, right? So four months ahead of Miami joining the Big East. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the ACC at the time was was big time, right? I mean, Virginia Tech joins. They, and what was it, 1999, wasn't it? You know, you had, a, you had two teams that became ACC teams playing for the title, Virginia Tech and, and Florida State. You know, obviously at the time, they were the Big East. I mean, there was a time when the Big East, like we're talking about it as if they were the ACC then. No, in the 1990s, the Big East was Miami and Virginia Tech. I mean, the Big East in the 90s and the early 2000s were were big time. Like I'm trying to remember, when did when did Miami join the ACC? Do you remember when that was, Vince? Vince? I, I thought he said 2004 in that, but I don't know. Right, that- so they joined in 2004. So like in 1999, a Big East team played for the national title. In 2001, a Big East team won the national title. And in 2002, a Big East team was once again the runner-up in the national championship game, right? I mean, because Virginia Tech and Miami. Yeah. And so, yeah, things changed. And all of a sudden, all those teams ran to the ACC. And the ACC was a football power. And then immediately they went down because Miami went back down. Florida State went down for a little bit. Right. And, you know, because then in 93 – uh, you know, you had not, in 93, Florida State obviously had their run. Florida State won the title over Virginia Tech in 1999. So it was two eventual ACC teams. But that'll that'll happen to, to – to, I mean, the difference between the Big Ten, though, is the Big Ten has always been a football conference first. Correct. The ACC was a basketball conference that tried to become a football conference. Agreed. And, and I don't think you had – you didn't – and the other thing, too, is it comes down to leadership. And the ACC, just in my opinion, hasn't had good leadership in a long time. I don't know what Jim Phillips is going to do. I have no idea. But he inherited a mess, and I don't know if he's up to the job of fixing it. We'll have to find that out. Yeah, it's going to be a tough task for anybody. Yeah, yeah it, it definitely is. He's up against it. He's going to have to keep yeah, it, around. Right. And, right. Mean, How do you keep teams about, from yeah. leaving that want to leave? Yeah. Because now it's going to be hit on right. his on his tombstone, on his right. obituary, the last commissioner. Right. Came. See, died you know, under exactly yeah. exactly, I mean, exactly. Legit, he's staring in the face right now right yeah marky e. stewart thanks for the super chat i've been to tiger stadium for a night game against alabama no issues great atmosphere coming and going i heard the rumors but people were great yeah and i'm i'm glad that it was good for you i have you're the first person i've ever talked to that wasn't an lsu fan that talked right. about their po- experience being positive but so great. maybe they've maybe they've changed maybe they've changed their ways but i've heard some really really bad things. Patrick Fitzgerald, thank you so much for the super chat. 
Happy anniversary, IB. Sorry if I this was brought up already, but any idea why Vegas lowered Notre Dame's over-under wins for this year? I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly, Vince, do you have any idea? I mean, I, I don't know why they had him at seven and a half last year. I have always, no clue. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always it, it's always about where the money's going. You know, they open it up and they see what side the money's going. If the money's lopsided, then they adjust the line. I mean, I, that mm-hmm. that's my that's my Vegas take on it. You know what I mean? I don't think there was anything that Notre Dame did or didn't do that made people think that they were going to be better or worse. My mm-hmm. guess is just the money was all going in one direction, and so they decided to change the line to get money on the other side. And that's that's Vegas in a nutshell for yeah. you. Yeah, I, 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 we talked about this in our show. And we, I have no clue why Vegas is down on them. They were down on them last year and year before that. Five or six years. I mean, you, yeah. you, they average, what, eight and a half on – you know, the, on wins as far as the yeah. over under. I mean, yeah, it, it, come on now. Wasn't I mean, it like wasn't it like seven and a half? La- I still think it wasn't a seven eight and a half, half last year. Seven and a half. Actually, I think I still have that document. Seven and, and a half in 07 and seventeen. It was in seventeen. Seven and a half and seventeen. That is correct. Yeah. Which that I somewhat understand because they were coming off a four and eight year. Right. Right. And they had a pretty tough schedule, but still, it's just like yeah, I don't. Care. Yeah, it's been eight and a half pretty much consistently the last three years. Yeah. So and. I guess eight and a half isn't terrible when you consider there was only a 10 game regular season in 2020, but eight and a half. But I'd be curious if that came out before that was a thing. That's what I'd be curious about. Like that when did, when did number, that line come out? Where I found that number was in August. The the article that Going I read. It right into that yes. season. Okay. So yes. it would have been after all the decisions were made about. Okay. Right. Okay. So that one I get. The other ones, not so much. Super chat from James Bucker. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Why doesn't Notre Dame get with NBC, create a big sports contract, and create their own super conference, grabbing the big remaining teams in sh- and shock the nation? We've talked about this, James, and I think it would be fantastic. Personally, I think the biggest thing that you would have to get accomplished if you're Notre Dame, which I think is totally within the realm of possibility, is you would have to get that TV deal in writing so that you could show it to these other teams and be like, look, mm-hmm. you come with us. This is what we've right. got. It can't be come with us and let's see what we can get. I and think it would it, have to take over time. It yes. was like, when does your, when does your league? Cause you can't, cause the thing is to just take a bunch of teams, you'd have to buy a lot of them out of their current deals. That's a lot of money. Other than see what's happening right now with USC and UCLA is their, their partnership agreement with the, with the PAC 12 is coming up. That's why they're joining in 24. That's what happened with Texas and Oklahoma. Right. As you sign, you're not like a permanent member of a conference. You sign a contract with that conference to be a part of them for a period of time. And when that's up, you can choose to go somewhere else. It's usually coincide with their right. team. Those now, are- what makes the ACC stuff so interesting is a lot of those teams are not just locked into uh, the conference, but they're now in a, a contract with them financially beyond that, that if you get out of this deal before your time is up, and a lot of them are, are or further down, you have to pay a lot of money. I'm going to say so. You know, you know, you have to pay a lot of money. Yeah. So it, it would if have to be something where right they're now, doing it over time. Yeah. yeah. Left right now, yeah. it's almost four hundred million dollars they would have to pay. Right. That's a right. lot of money. Right. So now, now what's going to happen is the ESPN is going to try to sue uh, to you know to get that ACC deal voided, and there's going to be counter suits by the ACC and different schools in the ACC that don't aren't being invited to those conferences. Uh, so a friend of mine the other day, who's a, a attorney, I believe he's an attorney was explaining to me, uh, the tertiary, I think it's called tertiary. Um, oh goodness gracious. I'm going to have to find it up, but it's basically interference, right? Uh, tortious interference or something like that. I'm not a lawyer. Tortious interference. Right. And it's essentially, you know, that, that ESPN is essentially going behind the scene. The accusation is mm-hmm. that ESPN is going behind these scenes and they are, trying to broker deals for certain conferences that would undermine deals they already have in place with other conferences. Right. Because they can't afford to pay the ACC their contract from 2036 and also pay the SEC what they're paying them. And so they're trying to destroy the ACC, take the teams they want and take all that money they have committed to the ACC and now give it all to the SEC, a bigger version of the SEC, which is smaller than the SEC and the ACC combined. Correct. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's what people are already alleging that that right. the ESPN do, which is illegal. They can't do yeah. that. ESPN is trying to cancel their own contract, essentially. Pretty and, much. Yeah. 
Maybe. pretty much by by right forcing people into terms that don't match what you know they're basically forcing people to not live up to agreements they signed right with other teams and it gets even more interesting when you're trying to poach the Pac-12 or especially the Big 12 because the Big 12 has a contract with Fox also and that's where there was there was some rumblings about how maybe some Big 12 teams could do that but you know I, I don't know how it's all going to play out but it, somebody's going to have to step up to the table yeah. and say um no doubt you know some say hey look we're not going to stand for this we're not going to stand for uh, th- what you're doing because we're going to get left out in the cold right exactly. like clemson's not going to sue they're going to benefit from it florida state's not going to sue they're going to benefit from it but you know so what was the latest rumor was that it was virginia north carolina florida state and clemson so what's going to happen is it, what needs to happen is duke georgia tech miami. Uh, virginia tech miami all these schools need to come together the and, and along with the acc right in file suits against you know whatever whatever whoever they can i that i don't know who would that would be because i'm speaking as a lay person not a lawyer but just from some of the conversations i've had with people there there, there are potential Maybe. lawsuits that would that could happen and the danger for espn is it, you file a lawsuit there's a discovery period mm-hmm. and there's some people that are saying espn may not want to come <laughs> out what <laughs> you might find in the discussion that's just that's just people making accusations i don't have any facts of that i'm just saying this is what people are saying so it's really interesting but yeah at the end of the day too james uh, nbc doesn't really isn't really a a a very strong company right now financially they're not in a great financial position right to be able to go out and offer the kind of deal that an entity like espn can offer well they don't have that's what makes fox different too vince is they're in a different universe yeah the NBC is not a, a really sound company right now, and they don't have Disney powering the engine either like ESPN and ABC do. That's true. And so they don't have the money to go start something like that. I mean, because it would cost billions. And you look at their their news networks, their, I mean, all the different shows. I mean, they're not a really strong in, entity right now. And that's why, you know, they've chosen to kind of go on, you know, one NFL game, one college football game. That's why they, that's why they lost the NFL to begin with. They didn't have the money to keep up with it. What's part of the reason it's much more, it's always more complicated, but uh, you know, but it was, it was about, they didn't have the money to compete with Fox and those other entities. And that's why I've always talked about maybe CBS being that, that third powerful entity that could maybe step up because CBS appears to be a much stronger business situation uh, to do that than NBC is at the, at the current moment. Because does NBC have any... Remember, NBC used to have the AFC, the NBA, and and Notre Dame, right? And, and of course, and all you know, racing and all those. And now it's like, what? They've got they've got one NFL game, Notre Dame, and then a bunch of horse racing and some NASCAR and stuff like that. You know, soccer. Yeah, I mean, Fox pretty much has NASCAR now. Really? Okay. So, oh, even, yeah. yeah, even more. It's Fox and ESPN. I don't remember anything being on NBC, to be honest with you. Uh, they, they have like the Kentucky Derby, I think. Um, but yeah, sports wise, they're not really in the picture anymore right. outside of Notre Dame football and, and sports that don't cost a whole lot Sunday of money. Night football, you know, yeah. that's one game a week, right? You know? it but all costs a lot less. So Absolutely. we're still dipping our toe in it, but we're not, yeah, you know, so they can yeah. still, you know get the super bowl and do some certain things when they've got their toe in the water right you know but yeah right florida irish with a question seems navy is the most recent example of why not to lose one's independence same great this is awesome i read this earlier and i was like oh my gosh this is awesome same could be said of penn state florida state and miami all seem to have declined since joining a conference fair or unfair yeah, I mean, if you think about Miami, they started to decline right after joining the Big East, right? They had a couple year run, but like by '94, they had faded. And then Butch Davis comes in, and they had that really short run under him, like '99 to '01, and then Larry Coker, you know, had that team in '02. Uh, you know, he was like, he was when he '99 is when the run started, so it was like '99 sure. to '02. They had a nice run, and then they fell right off the cliff again. Yes, uh, and by the time they got to the ACC, they just they weren't that good. Right. And, and, you know, Florida state that, that could be said about Florida state, but Florida state was really good for a long time in the ACC. I mean, Florida state joined the ACC, I believe in like 91, 92, they won two titles in the ACC In 93, they won a national title. They were 
when they beat when they lost another name but still won the title they were in the acc that year mm -hmm. they won another title in 99 actually they've won three national titles as a member of the acc so florida state's not the example to to utilize here because i think the acc was good for them sure because you know it gave them a home for a lot of their other sports they are not a program that's ever been a great financial program so joining the acc gave them a a nice. revenue stream that was good for a long time. Jim. It's it's gotten out of it's gotten out of hand the last ten years, and the in the AC they just can't keep up anymore with the SEC. But you also had a great coach, and I think that's something that has has that's the re Florida State's not winning right now because they 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 hired Willie Taggart in a mess. So, yeah, I mean, it's stuff like that. It's not yeah. it's not because of being in the ACC. Uh, Penn State has never been the same program since joining right. the Big Ten. They right. had some they had some runs early, like their '94 team went undefeated, and they had been in the Big Ten for you know a couple years at that point in time. But they've never really been that power. I mean, la they've had some years recently. A lot of people say, well, it's because of the Sandusky. So I'm like, that's fine, but yeah. they were in the league for 20 years before that happened, right? And, and you know that that didn't come into you know light till like around 2010 ish, yeah. Right? They've been in the Big Ten for 20 years and it never. One, I mean, they, they went undefeated one year and didn't even get a chance to play for a championship in 1994. So yeah, and now they're just a they're just a really good Big Ten team. They're not yeah. the, the national entity. Miami, same same deal. But I don't know if joining a league is the reason that happened in Miami. I think a lot of this is just leadership, poor leadership, in right. my opinion, is a lot of it. But I think with Navy is a great example because I, what's hurt Navy is. I'm yeah. I want, I'm curious to see what you say here. Well, it's because teams now see the triple every year. Bingo, bingo. It's the same. So you're not unique anymore. I'm exactly right. right. Yep, right. you nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. And that's that's the biggest detriment to Navy when they could create their own schedule, top to bottom, one through twelve. Then they could not have the same guys on our same teams on their schedule year in and year out. So they don't see triple that much because triple is not mm -hmm. something that is seen throughout the country on a regular basis. Right. So we talk about it all the time with Notre Dame and the different offenses that they see. They see triple once a year, you know, and it's Navy. The only teams mm -hmm. that do triple are service academies, and they play each other, and that's fine. But others, now that they're in a conference, they see those same teams over and over and over. And so now you have a chance to pick apart that offense a little bit more, and you have more experience from a player standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, all of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that hurt Navy big time. I think I heard agree. Time. And I, I'm, I'm sure they joined the conference for consistency with their other sports, yeah. all of those different things. And I get it, but from yeah. a football standpoint, it didn't help them at all. It hurt them. Yes. Yeah, it hurt them. It, it hurt them. And the next question we have, Vince, too, is is a, is kind of in line with, I think, fit really well with this. this I, I think it's a, we've talked to this about on the show before, but I, I love this question. And I've, I've wanted to do another show on it again. But I just don't want to get into repetitive stuff because I I, I love this topic. I absolutely yeah, love this topic. Absolutely. Tyler Evans says, what schools do you wish that can go back to being a powerhouse again besides Notre Dame? Like, so why does it matter? Like, why would I want another school? And I'm not questioning you. I'm setting up the stage for my answer. Yeah. Why would it matter if I care about other teams and Notre Dame being good? Sure. And, and the answer to that is, is because the more powerhouses there are, the more the current powerhouse that's ahead of everybody else gets torn down and and because here's what happens right if florida state was still florida state miami was still miami bama never would have been what it's been the last 15 years right and because they wouldn't have been able to, to they would have still been great they would have had multiple national titles bama sure. would have multiple national titles because let's not forget gene stallings won a national championship during the time when florida state notre dame and miami were powerhouses right so Bama's a powerhouse program sure. no mistaking that what I'm saying is they wouldn't have like six titles or seven titles or whatever it is since Saban got there. They might only have three. It would still be a phenomenal run. They'd still be the premier program, but they'd get beat a lot more. Because what would happen is Florida State would take kids. The kids that are currently at Bama would either be at Florida, some of right. them. Right. Enough of them to matter would right. be at Florida, Florida State, Miami, um, you know, pro, pro Notre Dame, if they were, you know, better than Penn State, Ohio State, right? USC, Texas, if they were still good, right? So, I mean, Bama's gone into Texas and taken some dudes that if Texas was what they were from like 05 to 09, I don't know if they get those guys out of Texas. Texas used to be unstoppable in Texas. Right, right. If you had an offer from Texas, 
That's, I mean, good luck pulling them out. You know yeah, what I mean? The only team that could ever beat them was like Oklahoma, yeah, right? who's right. basically considered an in-state school if you're in Northern Texas. Correct. Yeah, it was always very, very, I mean, they had a, you want to talk about putting a fence around your backyard. Texas right. had that much nailed down. If USC, if Pete Carroll was still at USC, let's be honest, Bryce Young is not Alabama's starting quarterback right now. Right. He's not. He's still the and California kid, is He's he? at USC. He was originally committed to USC, yeah. right? And so that's what happens is, is these big powers that kind of go down, they start losing their stronghold in recruiting. And so then Bama consolidates that talent more. Clemson consolidates that talent more. In the North, Ohio State consolidates that talent. You know, Jim Harbaugh not being a recruiting force, and he went through a time with with um, uh, Chris Partridge there where they were able to recruit some big-time players in the East Coast because he was able to tie, tie into his Jersey connections as a, as a big-time high school coach. And, and they had some strong early classes, but once he left, they've kind of gone down even more. They're just not the power. Penn State hasn't been the power. Notre Dame hasn't, until recently, hasn't been that power that could kind of beat Ohio State. I've said this before. I mean, I've talked to people that I know at Ohio State and be like, man, we never worried about Notre Dame. We ne- when we hear no- the kids looking at Notre Dame, we're like, okay, we're the- we're the- we're the- we'll have to worry about them. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so, you know, that's kind of that's kind of what it was like. And so now – you start if, if, you know, so who are the programs that need to emerge? Two of the Florida schools have to get back to being what they were. And I don't care which ones it can be Florida, Florida state, Miami of those three schools, two of them have to get back to being powerhouse programs. In my opinion, if, if, if just one, it'll have an impact Two, I think would have an even greater impact. So right now it's looking like Miami is on the best track because Mario Cristobal is a, is a Miami native. He played at Miami, you know, he right after their really great run, he wasn't there during the great run. Uh, but after their great run and, and uh, you know, he, he's done some really impressive things there uh, recruiting wise early on, you know, I think he'll get them back, you know, will they get them back to national prominence? I don't know, but it's good because now some of those ba- Ohio, Florida kids that were going to Bama might stay and go to Miami. I think that's a program. Notre Dame is one. Obviously we talked about, I think USC is one. Uh, they are look USC being, being a powerhouse just think of the impact of all the California kids sure. that are going to Bama and Ohio state and some of these other schools that would have stayed in California and gone to USC. And, and so I think that's Texas is another one, Texas right? Is Texas being good. And, and I'll, I mean, a team that needs to stay a powerhouse is Ohio state. I mean, sure. if Ohio state falters, let's say Ryan days, not the coach, let's say Ryan days, Larry Coker. Right. And, and, and he gets exposed this year and I don't think that's going to happen. I'm making a hypothetical. And, and and they they let's say they lose to Notre Dame and, and Michigan beats them again and Penn State beats them and all of a sudden you're like they're not the team we thought they were right like and, and he's not able to win the way Urban did he can't ride Urban's coattail I'm just again I'm throwing out hypotheticals sure that hurts college football because Ohio State's one of the few programs that's been able to beat Bam on a recruiting trail so they not only do they need USC and Miami because that's the key it's not just about Miami and USC and Texas stepping up. If those three step up at the expense of Georgia, Clemson, Ohio state going down, then Bama's still Bama, right? It need Georgia needs to stay what they're keep doing what they're doing. Uh, Ohio state needs to keep doing what they're doing. Clemson needs to keep doing what they're doing. And then Notre Dame, USC, Texas, at least one or two of the Florida schools all need to rise up in my opinion. And I'll say there's there, a, a third Northern team needs to become a force as well, whether it's Penn State or Michigan, I don't care. And then another team I'd like to see, Vince, and this is more nostalgia than anything, I would like to see one of Oklahoma or Nebraska be very good. Hmm. And I'd prefer Nebraska at this point in time simply because Oklahoma's joining the SEC. And I don't think they they don't I don't think they need to Oklahoma and Texas both. I think if the Big Ten can get back to having yet another truly elite program because then Oklahoma if Nebraska got good again they would get some of those Texas kids that are going to sure. Bam and other places right like if they were a powerhouse again they would get some of those Texas kids they would get some of those California kids because there's a school in Lincoln Nebraska that's a lot closer to fly to than all the way down to Tuscaloosa or yeah. Athens you know what I mean or over to Columbus so I think that's another one, but they would be at the bottom of my list because I don't think they could wield the same power now that they wielded back then for a, a host of reasons, including the fact that junior colleges aren't as prominent now as they were back then. 
you're just not you don't see as many big time JUCO kids. But honestly, right now, Bama pretty much cleans up on the best JUCO kids. So yeah, they do. Know, would, would Nebraska be able to take a couple of those? It's an interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. I good love questions one. like that, by the yeah. way. Those are so much fun. That was a really good one. That was a really good one. Sean Kane with a question. If you had to pick one player from the freshman class to be a special team star in 22, who would it be? I got Nolan Ziegler. That's I mean, you answered you answered there. your own question, my man. Like, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. That's my pick. Shortest mailbag answer ever. You nailed it. That's my pick. That's my pick. I I, I think he's okay. a, a more athletic, faster version of Bo Bauer. Right? I mean, like, and as a special Bauer, team guy. I think Nolan's a, a more team. instinctive football player. I'm talking about as a special teams guy. I think Nolan is a faster, more athletic version of Bo Bauer. That, and that's saying something because Bo's a Bo's a really good special teams guy. Okay, take it. I'll, I'll take Bryce McPherson because he's going to be the punter. Oh, there you go. There you <laughs> no, go. There just you being go. different. I I, no. I get what you're saying with Nolan, no. but yeah, I mean, no, I mean because that's important. He's going to have a he's going to be a very important piece. That's a good point. I think that's he's a very a good point. Be important in September on September third. But uh, we'll we'll see what happens there. I hope that we don't we don't hear anything about Bryce McPherson well, on September third. Look, I'm trying to be realistic here too. <laughs> I'm just think- saying, like if Notre Dame's if Notre Dame is what we think they can be, then right. the, the units that are going to be most important are going to be kickoff coverage. There you go. Punt coverage, and you know and that's kind of the top two, right? And <laughs> we don't need to. No, no excuse me. Punt, punt return. return. Punt return. return. Yes. I hope we don't have to worry about the punt cover team that often right. because right. that means Bryce McPherson's, you know, I hope he's not getting a ton of action. Yes, yeah. with you. Absolutely. So. Super chat here from Gavin Harden. Thank you. So he's the Big 12 merger that ended Notre Dame. If the Big 12 absorbs the Pac-12, uh, you would have a conference with Notre Dame, Oregon, Clemson, Oklahoma State, et cetera, that could compete. I mean, that'd be a that would be interesting. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm I, trying to wrap my mind around yeah, it. Yeah, you know I, I, mean? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. Honestly, I, I feel like if Notre Dame were to wield a, a heavy stick and and do something like that, I think maybe that could work. I, I you know, I think it would have to be an I don't think they need to absorb the Pac-12, number one. They would have to absorb uh, some teams of the Pac-12, but I'm not taking the remaining 10 teams in the Pac-12. They just – not all of them bring value. I'm sorry. I don't need Cal and, I don't, you know, Stanford and Washington State and Oregon State. I'm sorry. They just bring no value. Teams don't do anything for me. Yeah. I would much – rather honestly, I'd much rather see – I would much rather see – I wish there was a way, and I don't know how it would happen. Again, there's so much financial stuff. I wish there was a way that the Big 12 and the Pac-12 could merge where they could – like we've seen reports of, of you get those six Pac-12 teams, the Arizonas, two Arizonas, you get Oregon, you get Washington, you get Utah, and you get Colorado, Mm -hmm. and have them join with the current Pac-12, get you to 18. And then if if there's a situation where, you know, the the ACC – is struggling you can say hey look let's go let's go bring in Pitt and bc and some of those teams into the fold if we need to get into the 20s like those other teams because the acc is going to die i mean on honestly i feel like the acc is the team is the conference that i think could least have the save the sport impact honestly simply because they're already in a region that is owned by the two mega conferences if we're being honest i mean the, the the northern part of the ACC is dominated by the Big Ten, and it will continue to be so. The southern part of the ACC is dominated by the SEC. You know, to me, I think there's a better chance that the that the the Big Twelve emerges because honestly, even with Texas and Oklahoma going, there's still a potential for a big presence in those regions. Because I don't think, like, I don't think USC joining the Big Ten is going to all of a sudden turn the West Coast into Big Ten country. It's going to turn USC fans into Big Ten fans, but it's not going to turn it into USC or Big Ten country, in my opinion, if some other entity can step into that void. Uh, I think that would have a better chance. And then maybe you could rob some of the ACC teams as it dies. But I think I would be more interested in something like that than an ACC merger, like some kind of Big Ten, Big 12 is the is the foundation with which to build upon the leftover carcass of the ACC and the 
Pac-12, I think is probably what I would. That's an interesting. And I would rebrand it. I'd completely rebrand it. I would not call it the Big 12 anymore because it's stupid to call the conference something the number. with a the number when you don't oh. have that number. Unless you got the 24 and, you, you know, you had 12 teams in each division. Hmm. The Big Ten being called the Big Ten at this point is ridiculous. Yes. And it has been since they went to 11. Now, right? if they go to two more teams and they go Big Ten and they make it two divisions of 10 teams, then, okay, you Big ten. ten East has 10 teams. The Big Ten West has yeah. 10 teams. Yeah. That's a jacked up way of getting there, but at least, you know. <laughs> at least it would see, there, you know, at least there's right. logic in there. Right. But again, 12 teams in one division makes no sense. Right. I mean, if, if you got to 24, it would make no sense. You'd have to go to four divisions, which then we get back to, well, why don't you just keep this conference as smaller, you morons? Yeah, but exactly. that's a, a completely no, different conversation. Agreed. Yeah. Ethan O'Connor, did Notre Dame ever have interest, interest in Eli Holstein? Alabama will potentially have two quarterbacks. Do you think there is any interest between the two? No, there's not. There's no interest there. Notre, Notre Dame's evaluated him in the past, but there's the, that's not something that they're interested in. At this point in time, he's got a really, really live arm, but he's like, no, I think Notre Dame's looking for a kid that's got a really high football IQ mm -hmm. and Agreed. Eli's got great physical tools, but I don't know if that part of his game is on the level of some of the guys that they're looking at. And I think they would, they'd rather sacrifice a big arm for a big brain, you know, figuratively speaking, all to where it needs to go. Right. Now, ideally you want to go with both. Right. Of course. But I think, I mean, and I think Mac Jones has shown us, you know, look, you don't have to be, the second coming of John Elway arm strength wise or Brett Favre arm strength wise to be a great quarterback in college. Sure. You know, so. I mean, and I'm not saying he's a great quarterback. That is not what I'm saying at all, but Stetson Bennett did win a national championship last year. Right. But not because of him. I mean, it, well, I, and I, I, I get what you're saying, but for Notre Dame, they need a quarterback that can win because right. of him. Right. I get that. That's too. the difference. I get that. That's, that's, that's and that's what they've been missing for the, for these years. Right. Sean Kelly, will Notre Dame keep recruiting Dante, or will they shut it down and focus on someone else? They've shut it down already. I mean, like like I've said recently, Notre Dame's still recruiting him. They had some conversations, but before his decision, there was a there was a moment in the conversation where Notre Dame was like, "We're we're we're moving on," mm -hmm. right? I mean, it was obvious, in it? So I I don't think there's any interest. It, if if he had buyer's remorse and kind of came back to Notre Dame, would they entertain that idea? Yeah, I think they would because. I think I think Notre Dame coaches really like Dante a lot as a young man. Sure, they do, and they think he's a great player. Uh, it's just it's some of the stuff around him that it just got to the point where it's like enough is enough, mm -hmm. right? And I don't think it's about him as much, but that's a different conversation for a different a different day at this point in time, Vince. Tyler Bedwell, Notre Dame going to start its own conference and call it the Independent Conference, and all the teams can get their own TV deals and make their own schedules. <laughs> Kind of then, you're, then you're not really a conference, yeah, right? Like really... those are two terms that just—I yeah. don't know how they can work together. <laughs> uh, you'd have to—you'd have to call, you know, the independent alliance. You know, maybe like you change the word and then something like that. But yeah, sure. the the problem is, is that none of the teams that like look. There's some Ohio State guy the other day, and in, in the or I, I was on the Oregon show the other day, and some Ohio. I mean, these guys jump into everything. It's insane. <laughs> but this guy was like talking about like if Ohio State wanted their own TV net, you know, if Ohio State could do their own, I mean, yeah, they could do it, but they're not going to make the kind of, they're going to make money off of it, right? They're not going to come anywhere close. They can't survive as an institution, as an independent. They just can't. That's what, why, why did all those schools leave being independents in the first place? It's because they got more money doing, they could make more money doing that and they needed that money. Notre Dame just doesn't need that money. Yes, they need TV money. They don't need the, that TV money to that degree. Right. They care more about the brand. They care more about the prestige and 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 all the things that come with it. Where other teams just couldn't do that. So those teams couldn't get their own TV deals. You know, I mean, that's why I almost wish that we would just stop this nonsense of of killing these other leagues. And say, look, we're gonna we're gonna take Power Five teams, and we're just gonna form some. We're gonna break apart from the NCAA. We're going to have these two networks. We're going to split them right down the middle. We're going to go back to smaller conferences, so it's not the SEC, whatever. You know, you know, we're, we're you know, this league is going to get the old SEC. This team's going to get the old this, and here's the deals and whatever the case may be. Where, because like with the NFL, it's like the you're making a pitch for the AC, for the AFC. You're making a pitch for the NFC, but you're making the pitch to the same people. 
you're making it to the NFL, right? And, you know, something like that where and, – and then that money's going to be distributed evenly to those teams. I think that's the only NFL model I would support is something like that because what's happening now is, is going to kill the sport anyway. So you right. might step in and save it to where, you know, you're, you're able to do something like that because otherwise it's just it's just becoming stupid at this point right. in time. Completely agree with that. It is becoming stupid. We got a super chat from Cole Barker. Thank you very much, Cole. Thanks for the updates and information, guys. Been a member for several months, and it's the best purchase I've made. I agree. I appreciate that, Cole. I do. I do. And I'm sorry that, you know, it's – it's. look, I, I'm sorry that we are having the issues we have with our board. It's been going on for a month now, and, and I can promise you no one's more frustrated by it than me. I've got emails. Some guy – why can't you do them? Like, oh, hey, I get it. You're not you're not as upset as I am because you have to deal with it for you. I have to deal with hundreds of those things. Um, we'll get it fixed. Like I said, this thing's not even a year old yet. We'll get it there. And some some people are gonna, you know, if you can't deal with it, I understand. I yep. I do. I do. I'm not being mad at you. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not saying you're an idiot. I'm no. I I get it. I get it. Um, you know, because I was frustrated with it today. To I'm trying to in, you know put this post up and it took three minutes to go. I mean, cause again, hundreds of people had just run to the board as soon as Dante yeah. committed. Cause I was holding off my Intel piece until he committed. And everybody knew want to steal his moment and everybody right. knew that. And, and yeah, it's frustrating right now. And I understand people leaving. I do. I do, but you're going to miss out on a lot of great information during the time. And we will get this up and running and we will get it fixed again. We're new. It's just, it's part of the process. Yeah. But uh, people like Cole that hang around and are, are willing to say, Hey, look, it, I don't like the speed of it now, but it's worth it because of the community and all that. I appreciate y'all very much. Yep. And for those who don't want to stick around, I respect it. You got to do what you got to do. It's your money. You work hard for it. I get it. I'm not mad at you, but you're going to miss out. And because we're going to get it fixed, right? And Because it's not like I'm just sitting there like happy about it. Like, oh, it's great. I'm bored slow, you know? <laughs> right. So, um, you know, and that's, you know, and, it, and like that's kept me from getting a ton of work done the last month from having to constantly deal with this because I can't be writing articles and breaking down film and all. I'm dealing with this. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll get there, I promise. And I appreciate all the, the loyal support from from a lot of you that have, uh, yeah. yeah. No doubt. Appreciate it. Another super chat here from Chris Basker. Thank you very much. How does Freeman Golden help getting Sammy Brown? Well, I just think it's the same way you do with any recruit. It's just, you know, it's just convincing him what the vision is for your institution, uh, convincing him how he fits into that vision, convincing him of, of you know, hey, look, we think you can be a great player here. We think you can help us here. Here's how you fit. Um, you know, here's here's all the different aspects of of what you can bring to the table and building the relationship. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. It's it's gonna it's and that's what, it's true of every kid that's on the board right now i mean that's that's how they're having success is things like that uh it, it's getting those things going and so you know those guys it'll be the same it'll be the same thing uh when it comes to uh, you know getting sammy brown it's did you have do you have the people in place that are willing to put in the work to get to that point that's the question right so yeah fair enough Some update time, at least from uh, Bass and Domer. He wants some updates. Says Brian and Vince, where do we stand with Great House, Hannafin, Osbury, Love? Any updates on these kids? Also, what's the likelihood we hold on to our 23 commits? I mean, I don't know of any that I'm concerned about at the time. I know a lot of people are concerned about Peyton Bowen because he, you know, takes visits and um, people I think pay a lot of attention to what kids do on social media. I I don't. Uh, I, I don't think that is often a good barometer of where a kid is at. But I think they'll hang on to all their commits. Where they are with those other guys, Jaden Greathouse is going to make his commitment on July 15th. It's Notre Dame, Texas, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. I feel and have felt for a very long time uh, that Notre Dame is in a great position here. And I think the fact that he did speed up his commitment is a good sign, but we'll find out on July 15th. Ronan Hannafin, I really think it's down to Notre Dame and Clemson. I think he's trying to decide between those two. He doesn't have a decision date in mind. I think for me, I, I still like where Notre Dame is at, but I'll be honest with you. The longer it goes on, the more concerned I'm going to get with that, uh, in my opinion. Jay Nalsbury, where they stand, I think they're in a great place there. And that's another one. If he if he makes a decision this summer, I feel really good about Notre Dame. If he decides to wait, then it gets a little hairier. But I still think even that I'd still like where Notre Dame is with him. 
Jeremiah Love, we had a message board update on this yesterday. So if you were on the message board, you would have seen this yesterday. Uh, Ryan talked to him and he said he wants to make a decision before his senior season starts. Now, I don't know if that means end of July, if that means before camp starts or season starts. So he didn't spe- uh, game start. He didn't specify there. But he did say he wants to make a decision soon. And Notre Dame is in his top two is what Jeremiah said. So they've got to close. He has not made a decision. There's not this isn't a silent commitment situation that we're not telling you about. Uh, I think there is still closing to be done there, but Notre Dame has done a really, really good job with that one. So they're going to continue to try to finish and, and close that one out. And it's, it's, I think the fact that Richard Young doesn't have Notre Dame in his group anymore, which once Dante wasn't from Notre Dame, that Richard Young thing was over for Notre yeah. Dame. That was the only reason he was looking at Notre Dame was because of Dante. Uh, so it, 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 it makes it even more, okay, you're this. You're a running back for now. Yes, we think you can help us other places, but we want to give you a shot at running back. So I think, I think that's where it's um it's going to be. So yeah, that's of that group. I think I would say Notre Dame right now is the leader in my opinion for all four of those guys. The only one with a commitment date is Great House, and that's the one I'm most I'm most confident in. Okay. Uh, and then then Brian Crawdaddy's trying to suck up to me today. I want Allsbury so bad. You <laughs> man, Brian, you know. <laughs> That I am right there with you. I am right there with you, my man. I, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Super chat here from David Carpenter. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for IB for the Dante professionalism and the intel on the recruit on the board. The board is slow, but worth the wait. It will be fine. Right. Chill out, everyone. Thank you to the IB staff. I appreciate that. That's I appreciate awesome. that. That's because you know, like, again, good I, I'm not I'm not happy with where it is. It just it's an evolving product and it takes yeah. time. And I don't have sixty thousand dollars that I can just throw. Now I could up I could doubles everyone everyone's prices and yeah and and but I'm not going to do that because I mean, then you don't a lot want of like people couldn't be part of it. Servers right. like all in your basement, like all lined up. Right. You know, well, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, just like I'm not going to join a major network and right. and I'm, I'm going to do this thing organically. So it's just going to take time. Yeah. And I wish. I wish I had sixty thousand dollars and just throw at someone to to fix it now, but I'm, we're right. just not there right now. So, right, but it will get fixed. I promise. It has literally been my number one priority for the last month, which is why our content has been down. We haven't done as many. I've done as many articles. I've produced, you know, the breakdowns. Our intel's been down because when I'm not on a show, this is all that we deal with. So, yeah, trust me. No one's. If you think you're frustrated by it, believe me, you're not as frustrated by it as I am. And then I have to deal with you know emails and DMs and all, which I appreciate. I, I like people say like you know, I, you know, I don't want people to stop emailing me because then the one time that something happened and and, right. and I don't know is the one time you decide I'm not going to bother them with it. So I mean I I'm not mad at you. It's just that it's all of that time. So that's part of the deal. That's part of running a business. I'm not complaining about it because that's part of it. I'm just asking for patience as we build this thing up. If you'd have told me a year ago when we launched this message board. That we'd have well over two thousand subscribers already. I'd have said you're out of your mind, and, and that they so all I, to be maybe I should have dreamed time. bigger, you know, <laughs> and, and we should have made steps earlier to be prepared for the bigger crowd. But we just we weren't. And honestly, if I would have if I would have known that we would have grown this fast, I probably would have waited to launch the message board. To be honest with you, because I didn't realize how quickly it would grow. I thought we'd have a, a couple years to, you know, work then the go out. up to a bigger yeah. server and work the kinks yeah. out and all that, but. I'm blessed by it. It's just, it's frustrating. It yeah. is. I'm very frustrated by the fact that it's not where it needs to be, but we'll get there. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get there. I, I love this though. Nope. We are not Marshall. Message boards down equals ice cream machine is broken at McDonald's. <laughs> the only the only difference is it's not as frequent as at McDonald's. That's right. that's the difference. Okay, but yeah. the the withdrawal is accurate. I will say. Yes. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's fine. I appreciate. It. We got a super super sticker from Sean Stewart. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Stephen Lang has a qu- or a comment, I guess. Uh, as a Big Ten fan, I really hope Notre Dame stays independent. Notre Dame's independence is the only thing holding back the mega conferences right. at this point. That I do agree with because as yeah. soon as Notre Dame pledges someplace, you're going to see a watershed. Of it's over. Movement, right? It's at over that at that yeah. point in time. It, it's yeah. the conferences will completely die. agree. Yeah, yeah. There's no question, and I'm glad that they're staying standing pat right now as well. Yeah. Agree. Savage Scion Fitness, Brian and Vince, do you think Notre Dame is just waiting to see what the ACC and teams in the conference do before acting and jumping into a conference in football? 
I mean, maybe it's part of the conversation, but they're not just they're not sitting back and like waiting to join a conference right now. Like they, I don't think that's accurate. yeah, yeah. But they want to have all the information before right. they do anything. Right. That's I think accurate. what happens around them matters to Notre Dame. Sure. It's just one thing happening isn't going to be the thing that I mean, everything would have to kind of happen to force force Notre Dame to a conference. It doesn't mean they won't decide right. at some point in time to join a conference. We're, we're not saying that. I'm just telling you what what I'm told from my sources is that. Right now, Notre Dame's goal and desire is to be in a conference, or is to not be in a conference. It's Correct. to stay independent. And but they can read know, the room, right? I mean, if the, if anything, if the ACC folds, that's actually, I don't know if that's something that Notre Dame would necessarily be all that upset about because they're not getting a ton of money from the ACC. It's sure. like ten ten million dollars a year. It's just that they right? have a home for their, but it locks sports. them into five. That well, too. the ACC going away, they would still have that home. It just wouldn't be – like, it impacts football more than it impacts, impacts the other. You, you still have Duke. You still have Virginia Tech. I mean, you'd still have – you know, if those four teams left, you still have – Oh, I thought you were 11. talking about the ACC just goes away completely. No, no, no. Oh, the I ACC thought that's is a foot, okay. The ACC will still be there, but if the <laughs> ACC loses four teams, Notre Dame's going to have a very easy way of get a very easy path of getting out of that contract, which then helps it say, okay, it, that here's, here's how that helps Notre Dame. Because Notre Dame can now say, hey, look, Fox, we'll come with you if you pay us X amount of dollars and then you give us a little taste of the Big Ten money, right? Like we had in the ACC, and we'll or you know, and we'll partner that, or we'll just come on board with you as an independent, mm -hmm. and then we'll just go sign a contract with the Big Ten and we'll play four Big Ten teams a year, like we had with the ACC, or five Big Ten teams a year, like we had with the ACC, right? right. Because that, that ACC deal is gone. Right. So you, don't, you don't have to play in those ACC teams anymore. Now, there are some that Notre Dame would still want to play. They're going to still try to play Duke. They're still going to try to play you know, teams that are in that East Coast because they still want that presence. They, they may still play the teams that go to the SEC, sure. but they don't, have to, they don't have to play those five teams that are, that are scheduled out for the 2030s. So I think it would actually benefit Notre Dame in, in that regard. I think there's a lot of people that are drawing lines – to being forced to join a conference that instead of looking at it as like, no, that's actually could help Notre Dame because here's the other thing. If Notre Dame did want to start its own conference, the ACC breaking up gives them a great chance to do that. Cause they go to CBS. Hey, CBS, the ACC's dead. Get us, get Pitt, get Boston college, get Syracuse, get Miami. Cause Miami's not one of the four. You're going to get these teams. And then, Hey, we're going to go poach. We're going to make our Western division of this, yep. which is going to have Stanford and Cal and, and, you know what I mean? And then now all of a sudden, Oregon and Washington, and now all of a sudden, we've got this big mega conference of the East Coast versus the West Coast, right? And then, you know, you go to Penn State. Hey, Penn State, when your Big Ten deal is up, we'd love to have, you know, then all of a sudden, you've got some power to wield. Sure. Or they could just look at it and say, we're going to form a partnership with the Big Ten like we had in the ACC, and then the Big Ten gives us that, right? Because – you, you don't have to you, – you can just – and that's just for football. That doesn't have to include a partnership in the way that they have with the ACC where all the schools would go play there. You see what I'm saying, Vince? I do. And, and you know, I, I think they'd be willing – I mean, I think they'd be willing to do that. I think there's this notion that people say, well, the Big Ten won't accept Notre Dame's other sports. Uh, you know, they won't accept Notre Dame unless they get football. I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I, I don't because they want to just be associated with Notre Dame. Right. There's pull to that. Absolutely. You know what I mean? To say Notre Dame is in the Big Ten, except for football. You know what I mean? Like that that has that means something, right? Because when the ACC got Notre Dame's in the ACC. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For football. Right? Except for football. Look at the boost that that has been for that conference getting Notre Dame in there. Sure. So, yes, they would still want to be a part of what that what's what's building there there's no question about it so um yeah yep agreed yep super chat here from matt 2011 gt thank you very much is there a way to gift a subscription to my brother yes you can you can buy a subscription and pay for it however you want and what you would simply do is just use that person's email account and stuff to Great. get signed Great. up Right. And yeah. Or you could just buy an account. You'd have, you'd need a different email than the one you signed up with. And then he could just go into, you know, once he gets logged in with whatever stuff you create, then he could just put his own email in and all that. 
And then, you know, at the end of the year, if you wanted to keep paying for his subscription, you could, or it could just let it lapse, or he could then go in and add his card into it for future. I mean, all those things are options uh, to, to do that. Yes. Yes. And if you have any for, more questions, just shoot me an email, Brian at irishbreakdown.com, and I can get you squared away. I appreciate that. Appreciate the question. Brandon K. Would you ever let a player consistently play both offense and defense? If he could play both at a high level, I'm not opposed to it. Right. It's for any reason other than it's just hard for a guy to be at his best at both. Exactly. It's tough. Right. But if to Charles do. Woodson Jr. signed with me tomorrow and he was just like his dad, you better darn well believe I'm going to play him on on in all phases in the game to some degree. Right. Yes. Hundred percent. Right. <laughs> because he was one of those rare players. Because sure. he was such a bigger defensive back. Yeah. He wasn't like a 5'10, 170, like Micah Bell. Micah Bell would wear down if he was playing all phases of the game. He would just he's 165 pounds now, maybe. He's gonna be a buck 90, maybe. Charles Woodson was a six foot one plus 200 plus pound. Like he'd be like a he's like built like a modern day rover in a lot of yeah. ways, right? He can physically handle it where most skill players just physically can't handle that many reps at right. this level. Because also you got to remember the game has changed so much offensive teams play so many more snaps now than they used to where, you know, so, so I do think if, if a kid could come in and help me at those two position at two positions, as long as it didn't take away from what he did defensively, because that's the other thing, Charles Woodson didn't suffer as a defensive back by playing offensive returning kicks. Yeah, agreed. agreed. And, and for most kids, it would, you'd have to take, Hey, we need to give him a breather on this series because he played right. offense at series. Now I'm not taking him off the field as a corner. Right. And that's what Charles was able to do is he was able to, to do that because again the game wasn't played at the tempo it's played at today. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. The tempo thing is I think is a really good point. Mm -hmm. That many snaps, especially at a position where you need to literally run every single snap. Mm -hmm. That's tough. I mean that yeah. that that's really really difficult. So Yeah. It would take a special player. That that's what I'll say. It'll take a really special pl mm -hmm. player. Brian Myers, question for Irish fans, did playing in conference in 2020 make you more amen amenable to playing in a conference or less, was there any excitement chasing a conference title? The, the I, excitement for chasing a conference title for me was this is the one year we're going to be in a conference, we're going to win it, and we're going to take our trophy and run. Like that was the yeah. that was the excitement for me. Other than that, I, if it was a year in and year out thing, I don't think I would have the same excitement for it. Uh, I it makes me. I don't know. I didn't really enjoy it, to be honest with you. I did not really like being in the ACC. It felt like Notre Dame was just another one of the teams in the conference. And I don't – maybe that makes me sound like an elitist Notre Dame fan, but that's what I like about Notre Dame is that they're different, that they are they can do things on their own. They're not just one of the group. So I, I didn't like it. You know, it's just interesting you say that, Vince, because I did not like the specific schedule they had. But I actually enjoyed being in the ACC for that year. Okay, uh, because because it was such a, but it was more about the context of why, yeah, than being in a conference. And it was it was unique. I will say it was right. unique. Like right. vote for the conference players of the year. And that like, was fun. I've yeah. never done that before, and I got to vote for yeah. all ACC teams. Like you that know? was that was yeah. unique. And but yeah. but I think it would wear off if it was an every year thing. Well, it just would depend on 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 the quality of the league. Cause that's the thing that sucked about that year is like the, like we all said of Clemson, every team they played basically stunk. I mean, you're bank, yeah. you're hanging your hat hoping North Carolina can be good. Right. It, you know, it just will depend on the quality of the league. I, I enjoyed the whole conference championship thing and, and all that, because like you said though, Vince, it wasn't an anomaly. I'm not opposed to joining a league anymore. I, I, I would be the last resort for me. I don't want to join a league. I'm not as opposed to it as I was. I'm opposed to the big 10 right. being the league that they join. Um, right. even in the context of what I like earlier, I was explaining that big 10 thing. That's good for Notre Dame. I personally wouldn't want that because of my animosity towards the big 10. Everybody understands that. Right. But I do think I would feel a little bit of like a, <laughs> like if the big 10 took Notre Dame, but still didn't get football. Cause that's what it was all about. Right. Um, but I don't want them to be a part of the big 10 period, but no, I, I, I'm more amicable to it. I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. I would have enjoyed a better schedule. Sure, right? I, I mean, be honest what? with you, yeah, because yeah, they like they played Florida State that year. Florida State sucked. Yeah, you know, like they played Pitt, they weren't that good. They played BC, they weren't that good. You know, there was no, there was no out of conference, there was no West Coast flavor. Like that was the That's thing that I didn't like. 
Right. But I don't blame the ACC in the conference for that. Right. That was they, more of going for 10 games. It was a normal year. You would have right. that. You, you, Correct. you have you'd had USC, you'd had Navy, you'd had Wisconsin. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I, and I, just, I don't know. It's, it, is it wrong to say it felt icky? I didn't like it. It felt icky to me. No, it didn't because of the context of why. Because otherwise, they weren't going. They were going to have a schedule that was going to look like BYU's, which was horrible. It was going to be Army and and yeah. Navy and season. Yeah, I mean, like, not even it, Navy. It'd have been Army. It'd have been Liberty. It'd have been yeah. Sun Belt teams. It would have been you know. They were literally putting yeah. out tweets in the middle of the season, like, "Hey, we're open. We'll play." Right. You. You right. Know, yeah. That would. It, yeah. yeah. To imagine Notre Dame having to do that is right. Fathomable. Right. Like, that yeah irish shy town brian and Sh- brian and sean He's will, at, yeah he, he put this up earlier that makes sense uh will notre dame sports talk be covering irish basketball and or hockey next year i will say yes they will cover other notre dame sports for sure um similarly to the way sean has always covered the other sports and so yeah they'll talk we'll we'll talk about that stuff on that show for sure it's not just mm-hmm. gonna be about notre dame football it's going to be about Notre Dame athletics, and it's going to be about sports in general. We're going to have NFL talk and college football talk and all of that stuff. So mm-hmm. many topics. So, yes, Irish. Thanks yeah. It, it, football will always be the primary topic. And it should but, be. P- but part of what we wanted to do – I mean, we may talk professional sports. If there's, like, some big offseason thing, right? Like, you know, like if, if Sean was doing this around the NFL draft time, we would have had – draft experts on talking about not just the Notre Dame guys. Hey, who's going to be the number one pick? Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like we want to be able to kind of have like when the, if the Super Bowl is around, we'll probably have a show talking about the yeah. Super Bowl coming up. You know I mean? The whole point of, yeah. of, of having that show right. is to branch Sport, out. It's sports more. talk, right? Yes. Notre Dame will always be the primary focus, but we wanted to have the ability to kind of branch out and do other things as well as focusing on Notre Dame. And I think that was the yeah. part of it. So, yeah, we, we'll talk about those things. But, again, it's not going to be a lot because we also still have a business to run. Of course. And, and you know, like Vince had this great interview with Tom Noy last year. And then Tom is always a great interview, Sean. He's very knowledgeable of the team. Or Vince, yeah. he's always very knowledgeable of the team. He's engaging yes. personality-wise. He's very engaging. He's funny. He's, like, he's good knowledge. in front of a camera. Yeah. You know, he's got some, you know, some some body, you know, because some people just like I sit there and they're just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't, you know, somebody's supposed to do my hands. I don't know to do my ah, hands, you know. You yeah. know, um, Tom's great, yeah. but it just got such little play because there just weren't a lot of people that really care about Notre Dame men's basketball until the season starts and they're good, and then people start paying attention, right? right. So, right. Um, but yeah, we'd like to eventually get there. No, there's no question. Yeah. There's no question. Rob Compton, assuming Great House and Hannafin commit. How do you think the four wide receiver group and the four DB group rank with past recruiting classes? Good question. I mean, it's it's one of the better ones. It's it's I mean, because Notre Dame has actually signed some really good receiving court classes in the past. Fifteen and sixteen in a row were really good. I mean, at fifteen they signed Equinemy St. Brown, and this is the whole. This is why I laugh when people are like, "Well, it's hard to recruit receivers." Well, it was only hard in, when Dell showed up. It wasn't that hard before he got here. <laughs> the same thing at running back. Well, it's hard to recruit running backs. Well, it wasn't a problem for Tony Alford, and it wasn't a problem for Lance Taylor, and so far it's not been a problem for Dean McCall. It was only a problem for Altry Denson. Yeah, right. But in 15, they signed Equinemy St. Brown, Jalen Guyton, who, by the way, is a starter in the NFL right now, uh, C.J. Sanders, and uh, I'm trying to remember who the other one, who the other freshman was. as Miles Boykin. Mm. And so three of those guys are now in the NFL, Excellent. right? And and then you in 16, you signed Chase Claypool, Javon McKinley and Kevin Stefferson, right? And Kev, you know, Javon or Chase is in the NFL. Javon's had some injuries. He didn't quite pan out. Stefferson would have been in the NFL if he wasn't, I'm sorry, an idiot. I'm, there's no other way to say it. Uh, but that's a heck of a two year group. Yeah. You know, uh, and it just, you know, didn't it pan out to some degrees. It did in others. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, it stacks up with those groups, in my opinion. I'd probably put it above those groups because I think the bottom of this one is better than the bottom of the others. And I think the top end is as good, if not better, than some of those classes. But, yeah, I mean, these are these are four kids to me, three kids to me that would have a, that would be top 100 graded kids for me, and then Rico's top 200. Yeah. I mean, Ronan Hannafin, Jaden Greathouse, and Braylon James all on the Irish Breakdown board grade out as top 100 recruits. And all but but Ronan would be ranked as a top hundred recruit by somebody, 
And mm-hmm. Rico's 106 on Rivals. So, like, you know, I mean, I, it, it's a heck of a group. Is it is it necessarily where you ultimately want it to be down the road? Uh, maybe not. But if you can recruit that group of four type caliber player every year, Notre Dame's not going to be complaining yeah. about have not lacking talent at wide receiver. There's no question about it. Michael O'Brien, these top schools take very high ranked quarterbacks almost every year. Almost Notre Dame needs to have the mindset go after quarterbacks near the top, just never go all in on one. I mean, that's fine, and that's normally my standard too, but sometimes that's the stat that's the stance you have to take when there's a unique situation. And Dante's was a unique situation. If anything, the only thing I would criticize Notre Dame for, and I didn't put this in the Intel piece, but the only thing I would consider criticizing for now is maybe you should have read the room a little bit sooner. Yeah. You know, like maybe you should have been like when he started pushing back in April, maybe you should have been like, by the time you got to the visits in June, if he wasn't willing to commit to a visit, even a visit, much less committing, I maybe would have said, Hey, you know what? Let's start looking at another 23 quarterbacks. Now it, it gave him every opportunity. Right. Like, it gave him right. every opportunity right. to jump right. on. Right. right. And, and, and people say, well, like you, but would they be in a place to land those? Like people think that like, if they would have kept recruiting Jackson Arnold or Chris Vizina, Chris Vizina was going to make a decision before Dante was ready mm-hmm. to make a decision. And right. you would not have taken him if you still thought you had Dante, just the timing of it, you know? So right. my whole thing is like the guys are looking at now, the Nova Sads, the, the Kenny Minchies, the Brock Lenz. I would, I'd go after Ricky Collins if he was open to it, but he's turned down LSU and Michigan. He's dead set on Purdue. And, when you watch what Austin O'Connell did in that offense, I would understand why a quarterback would want of his ability would want to play in that offense. But you know, to me, it's it's maybe you should have moved on a month earlier to the kids you're going after now. I'm okay. I mean, Chris Vizina is a good player. He's not worth me risking Dante Moore over at a time when I really thought they were going to get Dante Moore. That's the thing is, it's easy to say hindsight 2020. It just that's just not where I'm at. You know, mm-hmm. I I embrace the strategy. I encourage the strategy. I'm not going to, because it didn't work out, then go back and say, oh, they shouldn't have done that. That that would be dumb of me. But I still, it looks, here's the thing, folks, is if you're not ever willing to risk, then you're never going to get the reward, right? Because here's the thing you got to remember, Notre Dame did not put all their eggs in the Dante Moore basket. They put all their eggs in the Dante Moore basket for 2023. Right. Tommy Reese recruited CJ Carr just as hard as he recruited Dante Moore. Right. Knowing that 23 is a here's the thing that stre- the part of the strategy. This is a loaded. We've said this from day one. This is a loaded quarterback class. Sure. There are uncommitted players right now outside the top 10 of this quarterback class that in almost every other year would be top 10 quarterbacks in a class. Loaded quarterback yeah. class. So you can you can take a risk of not getting a Chris Vizina. Right. And, and a Jackson Arnold. Because if you miss on Dante, you still have a shot at Austin Novasad and Kenny Minchie yeah. and brought it deep at from the first right. crop of kids to the, like the next group. Right. Not as big of a gap. Right. Yeah. A guy who's 15 this year may be a top seven, eight quarterback in other right. years. Big difference. And yeah. so that all factor, if this was a year where, man, there's only like seven or eight quarterbacks, you need to get who you can get. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if you don't, if you miss, you're screwed. This was one of those years, and that's part of what factored into it sure. to say, like, you know, like last year, if they would have if they would have gone all in on Drew Aller day one, and I'd have been like, oh, I don't know if you want to do that, because if you miss, you're going to be screwed. Like, they should have recruited Drew Aller and Kate Klubnik and Sam Horn and Steve Angeli, all those guys at the same time, and then, you know, pick one of those guys, you know, of the first group, one of those guys to, to jump on board. This is one of those years that it, you were in a better position to do that, and that's why I said at the beginning, I don't normally support this, but in this instance, I am because of the depth of the quarterback class. Makes so sense. that that is that is why um, that is why I had that view on this one. In my opinion, we have a super chat from Patrick Lopez. Thank you very much, Patrick. Appreciate it. Super Conference Solution schedule: five SEC, five Big Ten, Navy, and one floater, i.e., game in Ireland or a differentiator. If we agreed to only take 35% of a standard conference membership share, all parties win. So you're kind of in a, you're almost like a conference member of both, essentially. Yeah, where you're getting you're getting your own deal. Yeah. And then you're getting a taste of the other two. I mean, if they could make that work, I, I don't know if I would go five five. 
That's like the best of all worlds. I don't know if I'd go five and five because then it's kind of like, you know. Uh, I'd like four and four. Yeah. Or maybe a, five with one, four with the other. You take a bigger taste of one than over the other one. Like, you know, five Big Ten, four SEC. You know, uh, what I would say is, is I would want to have – the only exception is with one of the conferences, I'd be willing to take a smaller number. Yeah. And 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 say we want more flexibility in this. Like what I don't like about the ACC deal is that they fixed the schedule for 15 years out. Right. And there it's, was no there was no flexibility for Notre Dame other than how many homes and aways you want to have. You know, like you can never. And you know, there's some years they have three aways and two homes and three homes and two aways, but it's always like kind of there. Sure. I would want to have more. Hey, let's schedule them out three at a time. Right. And then you can kind of work out deals with the teams in the conference that you want to play. So you can say, hey, look, we're we're not going to run the risk. Because here's what here's what I don't want to have happen. You sign with the SEC and the SEC is okay. You you know, you can you want three homes and two aways. Okay, we're going to give you Bama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee. You know, like no, you know, let us have some flex. So hey, we'll schedule Bama, but the year we schedule Bama, we'll also make sure we schedule Vanderbilt. Right. You know, and and Kentucky with all due respect. You know what I mean? So like sure. that's the only thing I would say to have because you could run the risk of in one year. If you have no say, if you have no say in it, like like the ACC, you could have a year where you're playing. You could conceivably play Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Alabama, LSU, Florida, Georgia, no. USC. You, you know what I mean? Like talk about strength of schedule, right? Right. It's just be stupid, you know. But like you, and you'd have no say over it. You'd have right. no say over it. So that's yeah. the only concern that I would have, Patrick, uh, would be to that, and 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 that would be sort of my, who boy. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you, I, I, I love where your head's at. Like, I love that thinking outside the box thing. It's just you would need to have a little bit more say in that as Notre Dame. Like, hey, you can set it. You can determine two for the next 15 years. You can set two of them that yeah. you want to have. Big Ten will let you have two as well, knowing that a third team we're already going to play anyway in USC. So and then and then let us mess with the other three. Sure. Right. So you can determine when we're going to play Bama or when we're going to play your top teams. That's fine. But we're going to have some say in what we do with the others. And we are, we're only going to have to schedule them four years out. Something like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, I would want, I'd have to have something like that. I'd have to have something. You got to like have that. a little bit more control. I you have to. Agree with have you. to. Yeah. Because here's the thing if, if the ACC gave you Florida State, Miami, Clemson, and, you know, North Carolina in one year and they're all really good, then you can just, you can make up for it with the rest of your schedule. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Uh, whereas if you were locking in like eight to 10 games a year, I just, I'd need more flexibility. And, and, and Patrick, um, uh, so uh, he says, uh, my super chat was missed first time. No idea how this works. Uh, Patrick, I appreciate that. And I feel bad that you put a su second super chat out. What you have to understand is we get a ton of questions, right? We rarely get through half of our questions. So sometimes you may put a, a, a chat in and we're an hour plus into the show and we haven't even gotten to where we the start questions at the start of yeah. the show because right. we, you know, we put it up like an hour before and there's like a ton of questions. So I apologize. We didn't get to your, to your question earlier. And I, and I do appreciate the second super chat. We appreciate the first super yeah. chat, but uh, for new people, that's kind of how it works. Just give us time. If we start kind of wrapping up the show and like Brandon Pleasant will do this. Sometimes like we may miss his super chat. But he waits until we kind of get to the end of the show. It's like, hey, guys, just a reminder. So that's the other thing, too, is if you give a super chat, we miss it. You don't have to give another super chat to remind yeah. us of it. Just throw it in the box. Again, we appreciate it. Just say, hey, look, I had a super chat about. And what would help, too, is if you guys kind of say it was about this. Because what that may do is that may trigger like, oh, I remember seeing that. And, and then I go back and find it. But uh, I, I do appreciate it. I, I really do appreciate it very, very much. Absolutely. We got a super chat here from the Mad King Woe. And he's even got a logo. You see that? that, mm -hmm. that cool. I like that. Maybe it's just me. I was a Thank huge. Thank you for the super chat, too, yeah, by the way. Very much. I can't believe I didn't say that. It's like my <laughs> thing. Thank you. Vin Vince was so blown away by your cool little avatar that he <laughs> couldn't avatar. even. That's really yeah. cool. All right. Anyway, maybe it's just me. I was a huge Zibikowski fan. His energy, his attitude, the fire he played with. I feel these defensive guys Marcus is bringing in. I feel like these guys. Uh, or these kids have that fire we once saw with Tommy Z. I like fire on defense, Brian. I, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big fan. Because I think I, you can play with emotion on both sides of the ball. Don't get me wrong. But I think almost on defense, emotion can feed a defense more so than it can feed an offense. That's me personally. I like having those emotional guys on defense. 
I'll take them wherever I can get them. But yeah, I, I think too. I think part of this too is I think that emotion can be tamped down. I, I was told a story about a, a player that played under Clark Lee. That was a pretty fiery guy, and like Clark Lee would always try to tamp it down. He wanted really? focus, awesome. you know. Um, you know, and I think Marcus Freeman likes the energy. He wants as long as your execution is there, but like. You, know, you talk about Zibikowski. I, I, I'm with you. I love the energy. I love guys that play with fire. That's one of the reasons I love Delohi Gilman. And he was a trash talking, you know, fired up, emotional. Like, I mean, you know, Alohi Gilman's a really good athlete, but Alohi Gilman's in the NFL not because he's an elite athlete. I mean, he ran a four six. Sure, he's a DB that ran a four six. Why is right. he in the NFL? Because he's wicked smart, mm-hmm. and the dude plays with great fire and passion and leadership, right. and he's a playmaker. I love guys like that. Absolutely, mm-hmm. I love guys that play with fire and. um, you know, so yeah, and I think that they're bringing in more guys. I mean, you you look at Jade Mickey, Junior Two Alamaca, you know, uh, those guys play with a lot of fire. You look at this current class and, and some of the guys that you know. You watch Drake Bowen, Bowen play. You watch Keon Keely. Keon Keely plays with a lot of swagger, and I love that. You know, I, I want more guys like that. There's yeah. no there's no doubt about it. I love guys like that. I want confident players. I, I mean, Peyton Bowen plays with a lot of swagger. You want guys like that. There's no there's no question. Yeah, no absolutely doubt. want guys like that. No doubt. And thanks again for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And love your avatar game too. Mm -hmm. All right. Our resident Ohio State fan. Thank you very much. She says, who is your all-time favorite college football player? Not from your favorite team. I have a number 21 bright orange Oklahoma State jersey as my only non-Ohio State jersey in my collection. That's a pretty good one. He's talking about Barry the Barry Sanders jersey. That's a pretty good one. You know what's funny? My my favorite all-time not Notre Dame player is not a big-time guy. I, I've said this before. Woody Dancer was my favorite non-Notre Dame player. Huh. The kid, Woody. the quarterback from Clemson. Okay. He was the first like true like modern run throw guy. I think he was the first player in history to throw for 2000 and rush for a thousand. I loved watching that kid play at Clemson. Okay. I mean, I loved watching him play. And he was, I think Rich Rod was one of his, was his offense coordinator for a, a part of that as well. But I don't know what it was about Woody Dancer, but I loved watching that kid play. And I mean, there's been other guys over the years I liked. Um, I had a love hate relationship with Tim Tebow in that I enjoyed watching him play, but I just got sick of like the, the way the, the media focus on him yeah. over everything else. Like that kind of got on my nerves, although I enjoyed, I never disliked him. Uh, may say K brought this up one time when we were talking about how unpopular Tim Tebow is with some people. I, I do think there are some who dislike him because of his, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then there's other, you know, he's too emotional. I like my quarterbacks. So, okay, fine. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, but there are also a lot of people like Mace and like me that I, I hated how he was covered where it was, we'd be watching the game and like the Florida defense would be on the field and they're talking about Tim Tebow. Like wh- Why? Like they got like eight NFL dudes on their defense. Can we talk about them, please? Uh, but but you know, he was one, but I mean, I just I don't know what it was, man. I just loved watching Woody Dancer play. I really did. He was he was my favorite player, and I loved watching him. And Barry Sanders, I I, re- I remember Barry Sanders because he won the Heisman the year of my kind of my formative when I really bought in as a college football fan. I was 10, and I remember seeing highlights of him because you know, you, you didn't have games back then like you do, you only saw highlights, right. So every Saturday you're watching these just stupid highlights of Barry Sanders. You're like, what is that? Like, and I'm someone who was watching Rocket play, and I'm like, that guy's different because he had these like big old tree trunk legs, and he just he was an he was a beast in college. I mean, he was a beast in the NFL too, but his numbers were just insane. And and I'll be honest with you, you know who I really liked on that team even more than Barry. I don't know why. I loved Hartley Dykes. I, don't, I mean, it might have just been the name because I was ten. <laughs> but he was the receiver on that team. You know who the quarterback was for that Barry Sanders team, Vince, in 88? It was Mike Gundy. Mike Gundy. Ah, I was going to say that. I was yeah. going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that the, the timing, I thought, went went together. But yeah. Um, yep. I, for me, it's always associated with Notre Dame. So I, I did really, as much as I hated him and his team, I really enjoyed watching Reggie Bush play. I mean, I wasn't going to go out and buy his jersey. Or anything like that. Uh, no, we, I, yeah, I would have. We'd have had. We'd have had to have a comment. A conversation. Yeah, no, 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 no chance on that. I'm not really a Jersey guy to begin yeah. with. Reggie but, was fun to watch. Yeah, I. I it was fun. But I liked watch. watching Vince even more in that title game. Vince was so much that's fun. To watch. No, no, that's that's totally fair. I, I just really enjoyed because you could do a lot of different things with him. You could move him around. You could do some stuff with him. I enjoyed that part of it, and uh, and of course the connection to, with Notre Dame and everything 
that's uh, you right. know, I enjoyed watching Lamar Jackson play because he's the closest thing we've seen to a one man show in college football in, in a long time. I mean, with, they use them. Yeah. yeah, those Louisville teams weren't that good. Oh, no. they won nine and ten games because of Lamar Jackson, and he was fun 100%. to watch. Hundred yeah, percent, he was really fun to watch. Yeah, Chad Delpreet. I'll go with Delpreet. All right. Why do other schools, the other schools' fan bases, get so bent out of shape over Notre Dame being independent? Why is it any of their business how Notre Dame does their business? Because mm-hmm. it's easy to hate Notre Dame. Number one, because they can't do it. Because they're different. Yeah, because they can't. They they're different and they can't do it, and so they don't like it. And anybody that's different yeah. across the board, if you're different. People don't like you. There you go. Yeah, it's like, look, I'm, I'll, I'll make it simple. All right, we have a lot of answers that were that were long. Uh, I'll make this one short. It's what I've said before. They hate us because they ain't us. That's it. <laughs> and that's it. Yep. I mean, it, 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 it. I mean, it just it, that's true. And, and there are some that d- dislike Notre Dame because of some Notre Dame fans. But that's true of everybody. You know, you guys think you're better than us. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 Duh. <laughs> Well, you know? I hate fans, yeah. but I, get I, I, I totally get it. But I don't have to like them. Yeah. You know, right. yeah, totally. Right. Steve Rolf, uh, do you guys have a favorite playing surface between grass, field turf, or even old school astroturf? Well, that's a distant third. Have you played on all three? Do you prefer one for bad weather games? I'm okay. Where you're coming? From. I have the complete opposite for these answers. Okay. I personally love loved playing on grass. Okay. Loved it. But I would be willing to sacrifice it any day of the week if I if I if there was any chance I would ever have a rain day. Cuz I hate grass in the rain. I mean cuz it's oh. it's not just the wet, but it's the mud. Yeah. It's the puddles. Yeah. It's just it is hard to play football when you're a quarterback in in there. Now, if I was a lineman or a running back, then it would always be grass. Cuz I don't think grass, I mean at the college level I think mm-hmm. grass is the easiest surface to be tackled on. I, mean, I there's not a concrete foundation underneath it like there is for turf, and then even field turf has a has that. It's a softer than turf, but yeah, it's more rocks than it is yeah. concrete. But yeah, right. But you know, you still have something. You still have that at some level underneath there. But I I think my overall favorite because of that as a quarterback would be field turf. Mm-hmm. The thing I hate about field turf is all those flipping pellets getting in your shoes. That's annoying. It was when I'm in part of the media walking yeah, around. I, I hate that. But <laughs> no, if if I if I lived in an area where it was grass, I would and and, I, and we didn't get a lot of rain. I would absolutely take grass. Yeah. yeah. And, and 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 if you have here's the thing: in order to make your grass not become just puddles, you have to have it's it's just so expensive. Yes. To maintain a grass field, especially if you live in the north. Mm. I mean, it is it that's, is so. I mean, and that's yeah. where Notre Dame was struggling because I mean their their field will just die every winter. Yeah. And that doesn't happen in Florida. You know, it just it's just a different animal. Right. And uh, I think the location is so important. It's so important to this. Like, I coach baseball, right? I am a 100% natural grass, dirt guy when it comes to baseball. But I coach baseball in northern Indiana. Mm-hmm. If somebody offered me field turf, football, a baseball field, I would take it in a heartbeat. Yeah. In a heartbeat. Because I don't so have Otherwise, only – oh, yeah. I'd be able to practice more. I'd be able to play more. I wouldn't have to pick weeds. I wouldn't have to do all these different things that I have to do now on a regular grass field, which I prefer playing on hundred percent, but I'd be able to play more and practice more if I had a field turf. Yeah. And that's, yep. it's, it's very similar for football. Very similar. I I, I can trust what it's going mm-hmm. to be day in and day out if it's field turf. And so the yeah. location absolutely has something to do with it. If I was in the South and I could control the turf and the grass and everything, the grass at uh, the Fiesta Bowl, when they can move it in and out of the stadium, you know, it was beautiful. Yeah, but that's expensive. And absolutely, you got to yeah. be an NFL team to be able to right. you say, well, you know, the Packers make it work. Well, they're an NFL franchise that doesn't have, you know, the other commitments and they can spend the money on it. You know, I mean, it's a it's a different animal. Yeah, uh, I, I just had to bring up this question. We were talking earlier about, you know, the conferences and you're the big 12 with 20 teams and all this. I love this from D-Rock. Math and geography don't mix with college football. Not wrong. Yeah. That is so true. And Not that's wrong. what, yeah, I mean, the Pac-12 was the closest thing to it, right? I mean, the Pacific Coast, I mean, you kind of had Colorado. When you brought Colorado and Utah, it's like kind of ruined it. But for a long time, the Pac-12, Pac-12 made a lot of sense. 
the Atlantic Coast for a long time was that way, and then it went away when it you know got Notre Dame and you know was, but the, you know the Big Ten hasn't had ten teams in it since 1990. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. the Big that. Twelve has rarely that. had twelve teams in it. You know, it's like right. it used to be where the Big Ten meant you had ten teams, the Big Eight meant you had eight. You know, and now it's just look the pack the Pac twelve. Yeah. Is the only team is the only conference that actually changed their name based on how many teams they yeah. had. Yeah, because it used to be the Pac eight, then it was the Pac ten, and then Pac twelve. Yes, I for 100%. that, yeah. I give them credit. Like, there's not a lot I'm going to give the Pac twelve credit right. for. That right. I will. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Wait, we have twelve teams now change yeah. our name. And the Southeastern Conference has what? What are you southeast of Hawaii or Alaska? <laughs> I mean, not Hawaii, Alaska. Are you yeah. southeast of Alaska? That's why Texas is in the Southeastern Conference. Yeah. So uh-huh. yeah, it's it's pretty dumb. Doesn't make any sense. It's pretty dumb. But I just love that comment from D Rock. That was really really well Fantastic. done, my friend. Very well done. Joseph Salvatore was Avery Johnson ever an option in the last three to four months? Why didn't Notre Dame turn to him at some point when Dante began to fade? Well, again, because I think the whole Dante began to fade thing was relatively quick. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's somewhat recent. And, you know, the thing for me is when, when I look at the the Avery Johnson, I think that they they needed a quarterback that they they were confident could play quarterback. And I think the attraction to Avery was that he he may not be a quarterback, but he can definitely play somewhere. And and because he's a really athletic kid. But I think for them, it was like they wanted a more natural quarterback. And that's why other guys were preferred. That's why Dante was preferred. Dante is somebody told me that during during they read an or, or Oregon they went on an Oregon somebody in the chat said that they went on an Oregon podcast and they're talking about Dante's a dual threat quarterback I'm like if you think Dante Moore's a quarterback dual threat quarterback you haven't watched this film you just right. see that he's black and you assume that he's a dual threat yes. quarterback I, can I tell right? that, that is one of my biggest pet peeves yeah. when it comes to any kind of evaluation of yeah. a football player yeah oh, he's, he's black. black he's a quarterback he's black from Detroit he's clearly a dual threat well, you ever watched him play because he's not <laughs> you know what I mean like the most Quarterback on the board's a white kid from Kansas with long blonde hair. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that kid could play receiver at Notre Dame. Yes. But that's we still live in that era where people make those, and I don't think it's done out of meanness or anything like it's just it's just uninformed. It's ignorance. You know? I, yeah. I yeah. Mm. Yep. No, I get it. I get it. But yeah, I was kind of I was kind of kind of got a kick out of that. Yeah, exactly. Somebody said that I'm uh, I'm surprised Brian didn't say John Elway. Tenday, you got to remember, I was five when John Elway was a rookie in the NFL. I don't remember John Elway in college. You remember you know? him? So like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I barely remember his rookie year in the NFL. I don't even know if I actually remember it. I probably just have, watched games up in the – yeah. Yeah, or what – you know what I mean? Like, And then, like, okay, I remember – because, I mean, I, I remember him 86 and 87 and 88, you know, when he was in his third and fourth years. That's when I became a Broncos fan. But I don't – I have a buddy, though, 10-day. The reason I brought this up, too, is my buddy, Tony, will always talk about Elway – as Stanford. He'll still talk about, I guess Elway led Stanford to a, they played Oklahoma and I think Oklahoma was like really highly ranked and he led him to a victory and all this. And he said, he'll say, you know, John, I was best college quarterback he's ever seen. Just nobody, I mean, PAC 12 was kind of irrelevant to outside of USC and UCLA back then too. You know, uh, people didn't care about Stanford football back then either, but uh, yeah, I just don't remember him as a college player. And, and I, I, I just don't, I like, I barely remember Troy Aikman as a college player. Right. And I just because I just never saw the the pack. We just didn't see the only Pac-12 team I ever really watched when I was a kid was USC because when they played Notre Dame, exactly. So yeah, Notre Dame connection. yeah, yeah. completely yeah. Agree with that. Yep. Benjamin Weiss, thank you very much for the super chat. He says you often talk about certain populations producing versus few, very few, very oh producing very very few, few but very high quality recruits. recruits. With populations in the millions across the country, shouldn't the quality and quantity of talent be modeled by a bell curve? I appreciate your super chat, but that is so over my head. I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Benjamin, you know I love you, man, and I'm not being disrespectful. I just I don't know what you're asking. He's asking if based on where the higher populations are, there should be more better recruits coming out of those. There are. And there are. That's why Arizona is an emerging area to get recruits because- growing population and that's why i've always tied in um if that's what he's asking vince and i appreciate that if that's what he's asking that's why i've always said look at the look at the electoral college right this is a good way to look at look at the ele- ele- electoral college in 1988 when bush was elected and they go look at the electoral college in like let's say 2020 when trump was elected or 2016 when when obama was elected and just look at how different like pennsylvania and ohio and michigan were and where virginia north carolina were and Georgia were like Georgia, Carolina, Virginia. Were, well, actually, Virginia was always kind of high, 
but North Carolina and Georgia were very low numbers. Arizona was very low number. And then you fast forward now and those states are different, you know, and, and, and it's, it's really fascinating to look at that stuff, Vince. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of, I'm actually, now that you, you talk about it, I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up now <laughs> because I, I always find those things like really fascinating. And, you know, you kind of look at those numbers and you're like, boy, that's a, that, you know, how does that work? And, you know, it's built around the census and all those other kind of things, but, you know, it really is, you know, it really is kind of one of those fascinating things that I've, cause I enjoy, you know, Vince, you know, I, I enjoy politics and uh, not 2020 Trump wasn't uh, 2016 is, is Trump 2012 was about when Obama was reelected, you know, but like, here's an example. So 1984, when Ronald Reagan was elected, uh, Ohio was 23 electoral votes. Uh, Pennsylvania was 25. New York was 36. North Carolina was 13. South Carolina was eight. Uh, Georgia was 12. Texas was 29. California was 47. Now you look at it. California is 55. Uh, Arizona has gone from seven to 11. Uh, you look at Texas has gone from 29 to 36 to get seven extra electoral votes is a big jump. Uh, Florida's up to 29. It was 22. Yeah. 21 in 1984. It's up to 29. Georgia's gone from 12 to 16. Uh, North Carolina's gone from 13 to 15. Uh, Virginia's about the same. That's why I say Virginia's about the same. They were 13. Uh, they're 13 now. They were 12 then. New York has gone from 36 to 29. Pennsylvania has gone from 25 to 20. Ohio has gone from 23 to 18. Uh, you know, so so those things, Michigan has gone from 20 to 16. So again, where are those people moving to? They're all moving south to, to lose. I mean, if you think about it, you're talking about five in Pennsylvania. You're talking five in, in uh, Ohio, four in Michigan. Those are giant population changes. Right. The shifts. And it may be like two here, three here, five there, huge in Florida. But to go from 21 to 29 is a mom, is a monumental population change and that's where that's where it's happened and so like the states that were producing athletes it, the, the athletes used to be more spread out back in the 80s so pennsylvania would produce big time athletes and florida would and california would and texas would now there's just not as many people in pennsylvania and ohio so they just don't produce as many athletes and there are other reasons for it too like what are emphasis being placed on on youth sports I think it's part of it. You know, some states still put a lot of emphasis on youth sports. Uh, the part of the reason baseball, you see more pr- big time players produced in the South in baseball, isn't just about population shifts. It's also because kids in the South can play baseball year round, where kids in the North, Vince, as you know, yeah. can't. Nope. Just because of weather. Right. And so there's all types of things that factor in, but the population shift is where it begins. So I'm, I don't know if we addressed it, uh, Ben, but it's <laughs> always, it's always a fascinating thing for me to discuss. Yeah, no doubt. DMND13, first of two. Using the 247, uh, 247 points, what do you think the range will be of the top five classes this year? Seems to me like this year will be less top heavy and teams will be closer to 280 to 310 instead of 300 to 330. Mm-hmm. Then his, oh man, I had the second one. Is it, not, is it not pulled up there? wasn't star but i had found it and i will find it again here we go i think teams like texas miami and oregon recruiting well helps lead to more parity and it ultimately helps notre dame oh and can't forget how well michigan and lsu are recruiting too yeah you know this is a great question and i was thinking about this yesterday a buddy of mine says you know we were going over where we think notre dame is going to finish if they get the guys right now that i think they lead for and, and get a quarterback that's in like a top 250 range, you know, their points would be like 298, around 298, right? Okay. And so then I look back and say, where would that rank in past years? And it would be anywhere from two to fifth every okay. year. Okay. Um, usually third to fourth. is There was like one year where they were second, a couple years where they were fifth, but mostly it would be like third or fourth. But then, you know, we started thinking like, well, he's like, who could pass him? So then we went to like Ohio State's and we said, okay, if Ohio State get all the guys that we think they're going to get, and Ohio State was like would be like two points ahead of Notre Dame, 
right? So they'd have to pull. I mean, so we were like no upsets, right? Like, so like right. we gave them this guy, but maybe not that guy. So like we didn't give Notre Dame Samuel and Pemba, even though they could get him. We didn't give Ohio State Caleb Downs, although they could get him. We went with guys that like we gave him Jason Moore and and our Ar- Artro Reese and like some guys like that, like r- realistic finishes for both. Sure, sure. No big losses, no flips, no big upsets, right? So, uh, you know, we, we went through that and like, they'd be like a couple points ahead. We gave Ohio, we gave Texas like four more five stars and some other kids that they're, so we basically went to crystal balls. So like every kid that's like crystal balled primarily to one school, we gave them those kids and Ohio state would maybe pass them. If, and we gave, we gave Texas three or four top like five star kids and they still didn't have more points in Notre Dame. And, and Alabama would, would be slightly ahead of them. But, like, we couldn't get anybody based on where kids are traje- projected to go now. And then we gave them some guys we think they're going to get. We found no one that was anywhere close to what Ohio State and A&M were last year or what, you know, some other teams have been in past years, like Georgia was a couple of years ago. Nobody got close because of the, what he said is, um, yeah, he, he, like, it's Miami's getting kids they weren't getting. Texas, Tennessee – is getting a, kids that they weren't getting before. Um, you know, you, my Oregon just got a five-star quarterback that, you know, otherwise maybe would have gone to an Ohio State or a Notre Dame kind of thing. And so you're seeing the the, the USC's kind of getting closer to being back, although they're struggling still with linemen, but they're getting some – and they got a five-star quarterback, a five-star receiver. You know, they're getting some of those guys. So there's a chance that things could get spread out a little bit more. So teams that were maybe ranked number one with like 320 points in the past, are going to be ranked number one with like 302 points this year. And so I think that's a that's a, a great point that DM is making. I mean, it, it, it's funny you bring it up because I was literally just talking about this with my buddy Tony last night. It was just like, you know, like 298 may get them higher than we think it's going to get them. Yeah. You know, but even against la- other years, it gets them. But like they'd be fourth, but then like three is like 310. Like there'd be a gap between three and four. You know what I mean? Uh, or two and four sometimes. So it may not be the we'll have to see. I mean, a lot of this depends on how teams finish, but yeah, there's a lot of highly ranked kids that maybe in the past would have gone somewhere else. I think the other thing that's unique about this year is how many five star quarterbacks there are. Yeah, right. You know, so like they're going to naturally attract some kids to maybe go with them. That, right. Right. Absolutely. Matt with the super chat, I think the second one of the day, if I'm not mistaken. The boards have been better until today, but we all knew it was going to be a bad day for the board. Yeah. Very active. But thank you for the super chat, Matt. Really appreciate yeah. it very, very much. Jaywick13, you're telling me, Coach, doesn't – I had to put that in there. That was hilarious. Duck like vault in his house. I wish. In there. It's not there. And if it was, I'd be over there a lot more yeah. often. The thing. only the only safe we have is a lot smaller, and it doesn't have uh, money in there. It has – No, it has um, <laughs> firearms and ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just to be honest about it, that's where, you know, uh, I keep my, uh, my, uh, my pistol at night. But, uh, by the way, my, that died, by the way, because I have to use the key now. So I have to buy a new safe Oh no! by the bed. Yeah. So it's a bummer. I know. I, I, I wish if there's a vault with money in it, it means Angela created it and she's holding out on me. So well, you know the room that she's got, right. Uh-huh. That's the sure. that you just don't know about. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Mud room. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right. <laughs> exactly. Frank Buffa. Uh, let's see. You're getting another $4.99 tomorrow from me. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks, I appreciate that. Enough right there. Antoine Porsche Rideau. Doesn't USC joining the Big Ten hurt them making the playoffs if they lose to Ohio State and then still play Notre Dame and lose the same way it's going to hurt Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC? USC didn't join the Big Ten to help them get right. into the football playoff right it, it, they it, didn't they didn't join the big 10 for football at all right i mean that's the thing we have to understand texas didn't join the sec because it thinks it gives them a better chance to play for titles they did it to get money right I mean, guys no matter what these ad's and presidents yeah. all these people say it had nothing to do with football because if you're texas you're better off staying in the big 12 where there's like one or two good teams and to play a year you're better off being right. in the Right. Yeah. Texas has sucked for 10 years. You think going to the SEC is going to make them, oh, we might recruit better in state if we join the SEC. No, right? No. So, no, it was never about that. However, I actually think this helps USC it, it, more than it helps Texas and Oklahoma because I still feel like if USC is at their best, Ohio State's the only team that can rival them in the Big Ten. That's fair. You know, so like they'd have to base if they go one and one every year with Ohio State and Notre Dame, they're a playoff team. 
If That's USC's good. going twelve and one and they beat Ohio State one year but lost to Notre Dame, or one year they lost, beat Notre Dame but then lost Ohio State or beat Ohio State, they're a playoff team. Yeah, Whereas if if yeah. they're in the Pac twelve and they lose to Notre Dame at the end of the year, they may not be a playoff team because they're like, well, who else did you? You played one good team all year is Notre Dame and they beat you, right? So I think it helps them in that regard if they get to their full potential. I just feel like Texas is Texas isn't that same program that USC was in my opinion. Right. Now they may, they may get there, but I'm just saying historically they haven't been quite as right. good as USC I, has been. And I don't think they've been great. Don't get me wrong. Don't say they've won X amount. Of, I, I get all that, but they've never had the long, the same long history. This is as a USC is back to being a powerhouse program, right? Is going to be slower in the sec than it would have been in the big 12. hundred percent. Or if they join the big 10, yeah, right. Because it's Ohio state. And then there's a big gap between Ohio state and everybody else. Agreed. Where in the big t- in the SEC, it's Ohio State. Or I mean, it's Alabama. It's Georgia. It's LSU. It's Texas A and M. I mean, it's Florida. It's ten. It's it's great. I mean, gr- and if everybody reaches their full potential as a program, in the Big Ten, you'd have three his- traditional historical programs. Because right. I don't count Michigan State in that. I don't. I'm sorry, with all due respect, I don't. It's it's Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State. Where in the SEC, it's it's Alabama. It's it's Georgia, it's Florida, it's Tennessee, it's LSU, it's Texas A&M, it's Auburn. I mean, I'll take Auburn over at Michigan State as a historical program as far as the comp, you know, the competitiveness. So I think it's better for USC than it is for, for Texas. Now, it's not better for USC football-wise than staying in the Pac-12. But it is better than it is for Texas and Oklahoma. I, but, it, but again, like Vince nailed it. It wasn't made for that. Right. That's not, they didn't make this move to improve their football team or any of the other teams yeah. that they have. Right. Like when Oakland, when Nebraska started talking about well, we're joining the Big Ten because this is going to help us recruit. But no, it's not. You joined it because you were getting money. Yeah, you joined because the Big Ten gave you a crap load of money and, and you got what you deserve. UCLA AD is honest about it. He's like, yeah. we got debts, man. Like, yes, yeah. be honest. I got, I got mouths to feed. I got you know. I got yeah. I got bills to pay. That's yeah. yeah. I, I respect honesty. Yeah, you know, I may not yeah. like your decision, but I'll respect the honest answer. Don't. Don't try to snow yeah. me. That's how I feel yeah. about it. Yep. HB Badger, what was the biggest issue for QB development in the Brian Kelly era? After year one, all QBs seem to have gotten worse. Too many voices in the room. A bit concerned Tommy Reese can develop. Could be my BK PTSD. Well, I think Tommy Reese still has a lot to prove. I do. Sure. Um, you know, but I also think that I think Tom Reese did a pretty good job of developing Jack Cohn last year. Agreed. He got better and better and better. I think Ian, I think he got the most out. I just don't think Ian Book had the mind to be better, and I don't think it mattered who was in charge. Uh, I think that's about as good as Ian Book was going to be as a player. Now, the scheme could have maybe made Ian Book better or more productive, but he was who he was. And so, you know, when, when I when I look at it, I, I see I see a situation where – I got some questions maybe about Tommy's recruiter, but as a of quarterbacks, but not so much as a as and, and I haven't always agreed with his evaluations of players. Sure, but I think he's done a pretty decent job of developing quarterbacks. I, I think when he's chosen to develop them, I think the problem with 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 Phil Dracovic was that just there was just not a personality mesh there. But Phil Dracovic didn't leave Notre Dame because of Tommy Reese. He left Notre Dame because of Brian Kelly. Right. So, uh, but but. It was it was too many cooks in the kitchen, like you said, voices in the room, all that. It was Brian Kelly's demeanor. It was the pressure that he put on him to not, that that was un, there was already there's already enough pressure on quarterbacks, and then you're kind of doing some other things. It was poor decision making by coaches, you know, going with Deshaun over Malik. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. It was it was just holding different guys to different. There's it was different for every kid. Hiring sure. a bad quarterbacks coach and Mike Sanford, which ruined Brandon Wimbush. You know, I mean, there's all types of reasons why, and it's not just one reason. But at the end of the day, I think Brian Kelly's inability to establish a, a culture that fit that was conducive to quarterback development is just really, at the end of the day, the biggest thing. Yeah, absolutely. It was a trend for different reasons for various guys, but it was a trend. I mean, you can't argue it. Right. Right. Archer Are we Ford. seriously having a Georgia and Ohio State fans going at each other right yeah, now? Yeah, I, I, I got out of that. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> It's just a Notre Dame chat. Our, our, yeah. our, our, our buddy Archer, when yeah. are you guys planning on doing your 
Looks like Vince has uh, gotten kicked out. So he says, when are you guys planning on doing your season postseason projections? I want to hear uh, who you think the four team play. It'll be closer to the start of the season. So we're going to kind of dive into those. We're going to start like Notre Dame previews and stuff. like. I've had that happen, Vince. Like, uh, we're going to start Notre Dame previews and, uh, you know, starting them now. We'll kind of in July, late July into August because – what we have done in the past is we try to get all of our preseason stuff out by the time camp started. And then we're sitting there with camp and we're like, we don't have a lot of access. I'm like, okay, now what do we talk about? Yeah. You know, we kind of, so now we're going to kind of through camp, we're going to have a lot of those conversations. So yeah. Picture and stuff, then probably, yeah. so what we're talking about doing is doing a, uh, at least one, maybe two of our game day shows on Saturday. And so that'll be when like Sean and Vince kind of do their season preview, make their predictions. And then we'll probably have a show uh, as part of the Irish break, that, like this format where we, uh, where we kind of, you know, me and, and Ryan and Sean Davis and, and, you know, we'll, we'll then give our predictions. So we'll probably have two different shows and different formats because the thing we're talking about is, so we're going to have a Saturday college game day show basically. Right. Yep. And we're going to come up with a name for it. Uh, and, and, um, you know, it's going to be what we do every every Saturday morning. We'll preview the Notre Dame game and national games. And what we didn't want to do is have the first one be Ohio State Day. You know, we want to have a couple where we can work out our kinks, but also where we can do some season previews. So we're going to have at least one, maybe two. And and one of them will be a season preview by Vince and Sean. And then we'll have the other one with us, which will be more of a, you know, bold predictions, Heisman picks and all that kind of stuff. So we'll have a couple of those. And then we're also going to do something. Where we're going to predict the conferences and, Stuff like that. I always find those things to be a, a lot of fun and enjoyable. So we'll we'll do that as well. Somebody asked also, we ever have a viewer call in show? We get asked that all the time. Uh, probably not. And you know, right. like if if we do, it's like way down the road. And there literally is a Driscoll Sports Media Empire. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. Um, you know, because it, 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 there's a lot that goes into that. So it's not really. Um, it's not really something that's on our radar. There's a lot of tech that has to go into that, yeah. to be honest with you. And you need right. a man, you need a producer, and you know, all and these different things. And, it's, yeah. and it costs a lot of money. Yes, right. absolutely. Right. Got a super chat here from Curtis Hewitt. Thank you very much, Curtis. Given the change in the Pac 12, who would you like to replace Stanford with to play every year? You said well, Tennessee I, in the past, right? Yeah, Tennessee. But I, 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 my preference is, is that you know they they have more of a rotating. Yes, one I agree with that. West, too. West Coast teams, but yeah, if they were going to start a new rivalry, I would like to see Tennessee be that choice. Yeah, I don't necessarily want somebody that's going to be on the schedule every year. I, I want it to rotate around. I want an Oregon, a Washington. You know, if they have, if it had, if the if the constraints are, it has to be on the West Coast. Right. Then, okay, Oregon, Washington. I, make I just feel like if Notre Dame is going to create a new rival, I want it to be someone that's somewhat close by that's not in Michigan. You know, and fair enough. You're not going to create a rival with Ohio State. You're not, there's no one in Illinois worth having a rivalry with. There's no one else in state that can bring that. That's why I like Tennessee is because it is an SEC school. There's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, but that would be the one. But I would much, like to Vince said, I'd much rather have some sort of, yeah. You know, you play this team six out of ten years. Yeah, right. You know, like if Michigan State was willing to do that, I'd be all for bringing that one back. And that would be the thing that I did say, Vince, is if you're going to bring a rival back, uh, Michigan State would be my pick. Yes, I love I have a lot of respect pick. for Michigan State for many of the same reasons why I hate the Big Ten. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked, "What happened to Ryan?" Ryan's on vacation this week, <laughs> so Ryan has been working hard. We gave him some time off. So yes. He's still working, doing things, but he's yeah, he is. He is getting a week off. That's all. He wanted to be on shows, but I said, dude, just enjoy your vacation, (laughs) you know, recharge your battery and come back ready to go. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's why. Yeah. And then uh, Curtis has another super chat here. Uh, Thank you very much, Curtis. Hey guys, I've been a member uh, a while. And I remember when it was trying to get to 500 members. I know you guys will fix the board. Trust me. Stay. I appreciate that Curtis. Very. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the vote of confidence on that. And then we have a super chat from Caleb. Thank you very much. How do you think Dante Moore's career pans out at Oregon? I think Dante's going to be a very good player at Oregon. Sure. I mean, look, there it's not like Oregon's hurting for talent. All right. What I don't know is I don't know any I don't know how good Kenny Dillingham's going to be at developing him. I have no clue. So like yeah. I have no idea about that specifically. But if they put a good offense around him, I mean, look, just because he picked another school doesn't change my opinion of Dante Moore's player at all. He's, in my opinion, the best quarterback in this in the class. Now, again, my evaluations are solely, strictly based on uh, who, what kind of college player you're going to be. 
I do think there might be some guys in this class that maybe have more NFL upside than him. But in regards to who is, in my opinion, the best going to be the best college quarterback, Dante Moore is still my number one quarterback. And that doesn't change just – he wasn't that because I thought he was going to go to Notre Dame, and he doesn't not be that anymore because I, he's not going to Notre Dame. So do I think he could have been better at Notre Dame? Yes, because I think he would have been surrounded with better players. But, like, Agreed. he's got Kyler Casper in the 2022 class now. He's got He's going to have Dante Thornton to throw to him. He's going to have players to play around you know, play with. I mean, Oregon just beat Ohio State last year. I mean, this is it's not like he picked Oregon State, you know. Oregon's a good program. It's right. not anywhere close to their name. It's not going to have the support nationally and all. I mean, all. but look, Oregon's play, made the playoff once, almost made it again recently. They've played, and here's the thing, they've played for the national title twice in the last 13 years. Yeah. 12, 13 years, and they were far more competitive on that stage than Notre Dame was. Fair. Right? So, uh, He's going to be fine. I mean, I don't like how it all went down, but I don't put most of that on Dante. I think Dante's a good kid. I think sure. Dante had some influences in his life I wish weren't influencing in the way that they were. He's a good kid. And and his my opinion of him as a player has not changed. He's a heck of a quarterback. Yeah. And I and I hope he has success. I mean, you're not going to drop yeah. his rating because he committed someplace else? Yeah. You, don't, no. you don't do that? Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. No. Nope. <laughs> Wait, what's that called? Oh, integrity. Right. Yeah. Okay, got that. Thanks, Vince. <laughs> I was wondering where you're going to go with that one. Hmm. Just going to get a little dicey. <laughs> Don't worry. I still remember where I see your signature. Yeah. All I right. think, like I said, I think he's a heck of a player. In my opinion, hasn't changed. Yeah. 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 Got a super chat here from Matt again. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. If you had to pick one 23 quarterback available, who and why? They're all available, by the way. None of them have signed letters of intent, but. If I had to pick one, two, that's 23 quarterbacks available. So let's go with someone who is who is either uncommitted or committed, but looking. Okay, um, fair enough. It would probably be Austin Novosad or or Kenny Minchie, one of those two, probably. It. The thing I like about Novosad is, you know, the guy. And I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. The guy that really reminds me of is a lot of Jack Cohn with a better arm, right? And you know, like a little bit more mobile in the pocket, but definitely better arm. And also, so I, I like that. I think that would fit Tom Reese's system very well. Very smart, very good, very accurate. Plays with some grittiness, you know, make some tough throws. Throws a really pretty deep ball. Yeah. Uh, really nice touch down the field. But also, he's a Texas kid that knows all those Texas receivers. I mean, he's friends with Braylon James and Jane Greathouse. I mean, does that help you with Micah Hudson next year? You know, uh, so I, I look, anytime you can get a big-time player from Texas, I'm, I'm going there. I mean, yeah. that's where I'm going. So it's, it's not just about – it's it's partly number one it's because i don't care where it's from you gotta get right. a kid to play yeah right right, right? it's multifaceted though, right too. so i, I, I mean, like i like him as a player uh, i think he fits what tommy reese wants to do really well because tommy reese doesn't care about a guy that can run around and do all that kind of stuff he wants a guy that can sit back and throw uh and people say well what about tyler buckner you gotta remember tommy reese got tyler buckner before he we knew he was the dual threat guy that he became he was a pocket passer as a freshman on, uh, in high school so it, primarily he could run but he was a passer but uh, I think Novosad probably be my guy. But look, there's a lot of quarterback. This is the thing, and and I was hesitant at first to even answer this question, just because you say a guy, and then all of a sudden everybody kind of gets goes on that guy, and then and then all of a sudden they get somebody else. I was like, well, I, that guy's not Dante. Well, okay, that's fine. He's not, but there's you know I still think they're going to get a really good quarterback. Right. He may not be Dante, but he's going to be a good quarterback. And there's a lot of good ones available. I, I you know of the guys that I know of that they're going after. I mean. Now, and the other thing is, like, Brock Glenn is very talented. He's just a little bit more raw. I, I'd like a little bit more of a high floor guy. To me, yeah. I think Kenny Minchie and, and Austin Novoset are, have higher floors. I, the, thing I like, the thing I like about Brock Glenn is he's got a higher ceiling. He's got a bazooka for an arm, and he's the best athlete of the group. I just think the feel for the game is better with Novoset and, and Kenny Minchie for me. So I, I'll go there. But if they got any of those three guys, I'd be like, pfft, big plus. Big plus. No question. Story time with Uncle Brian. HB Badger <laughs> says, Brian, after hearing that Willingham Mark Sanchez story and other crazy recruiting stories about, mm -hmm. or any other crazy recruiting stories about Tyrone, heard when he was at UW, he was golfing during one of their fall practices. That would not shock me. Wow. That I, takes I, some stone yeah, right there. I, I, I have heard some other stories, Woo! but honestly, I can't confirm them as much. Like, I've heard the one about Sanchez from eight or nine people. Right. In some form. 
a lot of the other stories I haven't I haven't heard from more than one person. It's been like anecdotal, and I don't like share. I don't like blasting somebody's reputation on an anecdotal thing from one person. You, you could find a, a customer that's like, man, Driscoll guy's an a hole, and then you find somebody else like, hey, he, he's really helpful. You know, like I, I try to have as much confirmation <laughs> as possible. Yeah. Uh, you know, with 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 those stories before I go public with it. You know, and and so there's not a lot of others I'd like to tell, but they all kind of involve this sort of thing just overall laziness and apathy yeah. is really what it is really what a lot of it boiled down to um you know so, so somebody uh josh buffo the motivational business speaker said shouldn't we be thinking better than jack cone level uh, i think you missed what i said number one comparisons aren't direct comparisons it's not he's going to be as good as this guy but if jack cone had a better arm that's one heck of a fr- – Jack Cohn was pretty good last year, right? Yeah. Somebody said to me, well, he's not mobile. I don't care who they had at quarterback last year. With that offensive line, I was like, Jack Cohn didn't get sacked a whole lot at Wisconsin, right? right. Uh, but I said Jack Cohn with a better arm. I mean, that, that's pretty good. But also, I think the, the point of a comp isn't to say he's going to be this guy in college. It's about skill set, how he plays – his throwing motion is similar. They have a lot of how they play the game in common. It doesn't mean they're a direct correlation on their right. skill level, right? And that's why I tried to say better arm. But you give me Jack Cohen a better arm, and that's a heck of a college quarterback. Jack Cohen's a pretty good college quarterback. Anyway. Yeah, yes. And if you and, put Jack Cohen behind this year's offensive line, right? Jack I mean, Cohen's going to Jack Cohen started for, for two years in college. Right. His first year, he led his team to a Rose Bowl, the Big Ten Championship. In his second year, he led him within a, an upset victory of, against Alabama by Auburn or an SEC title game victory uh, by uh, uh, Georgia. Georgia over Alabama to a playoff. And that, that kid's a pretty good freaking quarterback. Yeah, right. It just – last year, the early – like no one's going to forgive him for how he played early in the year in like from Toledo to, you know, Virginia Tech. But that was more about what was around him than it was Jack Cohn. Yeah, in my agreed. opinion. Absolutely. So, yeah, agreed. Had, had a, how, yeah. how many losses did he have that other year of being a starter? They were 10 and 4. Ten and they four. lost to Ohio State twice. He's got six career. And then losses. he lost to Justin Herbert by two to four points in the Rose Bowl. So he's 21 and 6. Yes. Yes. It's not bad. 21 and 6. And they lost to Justin Herbert in Oregon, mm-hmm. uh, a playoff team in Cincinnati, two losses to Ohio, to Ohio State. They had, he had one bad loss. I think they lost to like Illinois. Okay. Like they had one bad loss. But yeah, they when they lost, it was to teams that were better than them, with the exception of Cincinnati. I would say. Yeah. Like his losses was consorted to teams that were better than they were. So um, but yeah, like but again, it's but it's not meant to be a direct he's gonna be Jack right. Cohen. It's about comparing a skill set. Like somebody said he should use Mac Jones. No, because he's a different type of player than Mac Jones. His throwing motion is different. Like Mac Jones has a very traditional throwing motion. If you go look at Austin Nova said his throwing motion looks like Jack Cones, right? He's a drop back accuracy, precision, those type of things. But there's a lot of other things to it as well. And that's why that's why that comparison works. So um yeah, so Tom Frowley, yeah. I'll ask again. Uh, Apparently we haven't got to enough questions today. Uh, <laughs> will Steve Angeli see success at Notre Dame? I don't know. I, I mean, I hope if he gets a chance, I hope so. Yeah, I I think there's going to be guys that are going to beat him out, but I, yeah, I hope so. I think the answer yeah. to that question would be if somebody gets hurt, do I think he can have success? Yeah, I think he mm-hmm. can have success. I just don't think if you if you stack up all the quarterbacks that are in the room now and that will be in the room moving forward, and they're mm-hmm. all healthy, I don't know. I don't see Steve make getting on the field. Right. You know, is he going to get an opportunity? He might, but again, I think injuries yep. are going to be involved. Yep, I agree. I agree. All okay. right. That's going to do it, Vince. Okay. Sounds good. That's going to do it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast, the Friday free-for-all mailbag. Love everybody in here. Love what you guys bring to the table because we could do this for eight straight hours and never run out of questions. And yeah. we appreciate that very, very much. And thanks to my guy, Mace AK. He'll get us out of here. Join the message board. It's still a great place to be. Hit the um, the thumbs up button, the like button, subscribe, the notification bell, share this podcast, and leave a five-star review. Visit the IB store for some awesome
merch like Brian's shirt. And as always, go Irish. Vince's both. shirt, Vince's hat. So it's Vince's hat is day. actually in the – is that the old one I got it's you? It's the or old one. The one? Okay. It's the old one with the, okay. the fitted version. But okay. I love this hat. It just yeah. – it hugs my brain. Yeah. We got this hat's in the merch store, right? Got the white yeah, one that's, that Vince was look, rocking yesterday. Look, there it is. That, that, that's a got it right hat. there. Got, got the right blue there. version of that over there as well. So the blue yeah, one's in the mail, baby. Stuff. Blue one's coming to me, and I'm yeah. excited about I, it. And I'm almost like, so I'm waiting for the fall for football. Like, no, I'm waiting on the fall so I can start wearing the sweats again. Those things are so oh, those things are so comfortable. Those, those were a staple for me uh, teaching PE. Just yeah. gonna say that. So yep, those are rock. Yep, and and if we missed any super chats, I I apologize. I, I really I think I we, do. We had a oh, million God. questions today. So, tons of great questions and comments. Yeah. Today was a good one. So I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. So anyway, that's going to do it for for us, everybody. We'll, Sean and I will have a show tomorrow. So the RTCF show will be back tomorrow. Uh, really appreciate you all very much. Have a great day. And thank you for being with us on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. <laughs>